I think people now are looking at them and saying, look, if China pays off the way that it, we think it could pay off, this is huge. It's a game changer. And make no mistake, in the world of electric vehicles, guys, you will hear everybody say, there's competition coming, there's competition coming. They dominate. They dominate the market. And until they are proven to not be the dominant automaker in electric vehicles, they enjoy that advantage. There it is. Before we let you go, totally one more thing. We'll make it a triple. You, you got something for Boeing? No. Phil? Oh, Boeing. No, I just think that they're in the process. And I feel it's a process right. at this point, right? It, yeah. It, it, yeah. I can't I think say I, more than that. Jim, you look at the next, let's say, six to eight weeks. Between now and mid-February, that's really crucial to see if they make some progress there. Uh, and they are working with the FAA, and, and it's likely that we do see some type of certification flight. But one thing you're not going to see from Dave Calhoun you are not going to see him put out some kind of a target and say, we're going to have this by this date. He is more focused on making sure that they work with the FAA and that the FAA says, yeah, this is what you need to do. Phil, look, I flew um, to an island in the Caribbean, and I, I can't tell you how many people said, did you fly with that air, particular airline because they are Airbus? I mean, this is Boeing we're talking about. It, 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 it's right. Boeing's a great American company. It is shocking to me how people just say, well, I want to be on an Airbus. I don't want to be on a Boeing. When can Boeing uh, make it so that, I mean, geez, this Max. I mean, can I, they I do think, something so substantive? Yeah. No, Jim, I, I think that it's going to take several months for them to get past that. I think once it starts again, and look, we are going to have both on social media as well as other reports, of let's say somebody takes off on a max flight. You know, every day there are dozens of airliners that turn around for a variety of reasons. They turn around and they go back and they make a landing at the airport. When that happens with a max plane in the first couple of months, you will immediately hear people say, oh boy, here we go. There's a problem with the max. There's a problem with the max. It's going to take them some time to get past this. That's just the reality. There's nothing else you can do. You can't brand your way out of this. You can work with the airlines to try to reassure customers. But at the end of the day, you just need to get past it. And I think it's going to take, I don't know, two, three, four months before you finally hear people stop bringing it up. All right. Phil, we appreciate it. LeBeau yeah. handles everything. Now, what do we think about the fact that the biggest stories right now are Tesla and the fact that they've been able to conquer China? And Boeing, what are these saying? I mean, Boeing, obviously, a national treasure. It, it has to be kept alive, no matter what. Uh, Tesla's gone from being a, 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 a joke, according to the bears, to being something that after they built the China, just like Phil said, he said, listen, it, it changed the cat. It's, it's no longer, it's now like a great American manufacturer like Boeing, except for it's not tainted. So, I mean, I'm just, these are both great American manufacturers, and people like them more than all these fabulous tech stocks. I mean, people like Tesla more than any tech stock. Let's it's talk a ab- tech stock. Let's talk about a tech stock. Uh, Which Apple, one? Apple. Uh, yeah, it's barely down now. Giving up 300, but barely. Uh, yesterday closed 330, crossed 300 for the first time ever. It's uh, 299 and change. Can't it just go down for a little bit? I mean, oh. I say own it, don't trade it, but yeah. You know, some, I mean, when everyone's chasing like this, it's not been the time to buy. And you know how I feel about Apple. I know you love it, but is it yeah. too high at 300? Makes no, sense I to just, you? I mean, I just don't. At this, today, literally today, last year, we had all these price cut, ta- uh, target prices cut. We had some very big downgrades. Well, here we have upgrades, and, and, and they love it. That's not, that's, the time to buy is when they hate it. Now, I, I say own it, but now you're going to get a chance. Of, I mean, how can this, Jesus, the stock is barely down. I mean, the, the time to buy this thing, if, if you didn't own it or you wanted to add, was when it was sub 150 oh, yeah. a year well, ago or whatever. That's that when was, people, I mean, eight look, months ago. Every time it stocks down, there are people, including some who come on your show, nice people, who say that the best times are, 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 are behind. They denigrate, to, someone denigrated Tim Cook in my, in my, no in my, have, my Twitter file. I, I, call, I no sparked idea who you're talking about. I sparked him. I mean, I said, listen, Sparky, get a life. Look, I mean, this has changed everybody's life, and it wasn't just, there's like Tim Cook is, runs the company. Did Tim Cook runs? He came out under Tim Cook. I Biggest know. problem, the stores are too crowded, high quality. Sure, but it's, the stock what? is up like 90%. It's being valued as a consumer product company that has suddenly, the, I have a lifetime value. And don't forget, they, Apple TV Plus just gets... The Game of Thrones guy? Plepler? Plepler. I thought that I thought they were a bunch of clowns in Apple TV. Aren't they clowns? I mean, what kind of clowns can get the number one guy? They ain't clowns. Playoffs? 
playoffs. <laughs> I mean, honest to God, I mean, I, they're, they're not clowns. I mean, they're the best company in the world. Tim Cook's the best CEO. I wanted him to be named uh, the uh, time man of the year, but, you know, they had to, you know, Greta's is fabulous. And plastic Apple, bottles Apple's are got, horrible. Apple's got 300 back, uh, 350 cents. Yeah. Uh, watch what that stock does. Uh, there's some other technology Look stocks. Look at it's that, down five cents. You know, I mean, we didn't get on. to... You know, Give it a break. Peloton's up. Will you stop? What? I mean, okay, you, you went to Peloton, so I'll go there with you. Yesterday, Mark Mahaney put out his list Love. of internet surprises for yeah. this coming year. Mm-hmm. And one of them was that the IPO duds, and Peloton was, was on his list, was going to be one of the winners this year. If Along Uber, with Uber and Lyft, which he says right. are going to get profitability in 2020. All Uber has to do is close the stupid Uber Eats or offload it to Grub. Don't buy anything. Grub, they got to get the stock. They love the stock hire. Or sell it to one of these, like, guys with the Japanese, you know, with the Masa Sun. I know he did. Yes, he had uh, some big hits. But all you got to do is get rid SoftBank. of it. SoftBank. So, I know soft. I just didn't want to say their well, name. is too mean. I, I, say like it. I just want to make like, sure everybody else you know, knows what we're talking about. You know, it's like... Uh, it, 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 it's like saying the former CEO of GE. I don't do these things anymore. Not everybody has, you know, masa on the No, but I'm, their I'm, tongue, not, you know? I'm not saying these guys. Because then when I start calling people clowns, I get in trouble. Who do I get in trouble with? Calling these people clowns? Look, you I just... Just fact. Don't get into trouble on your first day back. No, no. Oh, look, I'm just... No, I don't. Um, but I just think that Uber has a, a easy plan. They just have to get rid of the 50% of the love of what is the cities that are losing money. I know that business. That is the crummiest. I, I got guys fighting to deliver my pizza, which got an 8.2 from one bite and crushed it. One of the best in Brooklyn. No, I'm not kidding. What is the worst business in the world? People come in, they like give you, they fight to have my business. I, I, they make very little money. Who wants to be in the. Oh, the pizza at your restaurant. I... No, no, the pizza I buy, the, my, my Elio's pizza from my freezer. I know we got to move on, but I can just say that if they close that, uh, Uber goes to 45 instantly. All right. Bob Pisani's on the floor with What's Moving. Hey, Bob. Busy morning. Good morning, guys. Happy Friday. Uh, this is a great example of what Don Rumsfeld called the known unknowns. We knew about tensions with Iran. We did not know that it would take this kind of turn, though. Known unknowns. Great phrase from Rumsfeld. Rather predictable turn in the stock market here. Some, not all energy stocks moved up. Uh, gold miners are moving up. Gold's been uh, pretty good recently. It's near a six-year high. What we were 15, 60 or so uh, a couple of months ago, but we're not far from breaking through that. Semis uh, and uh, China stocks, which have had a great run recently, uh, down a little bit here, working off some oversold conditions. Elsewhere in the energy patch, your high beta energy names. These are stocks that always move a lot more than the overall market. Uh, Marathon, Apache, Devon moving here. Over in London, you might be surprised, like BP and Royal Dutch, only one to two moves. If this was 10 or 15 years ago and this happened, there would be a lot more violent moves. It's a much, much different world in the energy sector than it was 10 years ago, and certainly 30 and 40 years ago, where these would have had titanic moves uh, back then. You might want to look at shipping companies here. Shipping had a very good fourth quarter on hopes that the trade and tariff wars would lessen, and we'd see some kind of bottoming in the global economy. Most of these names moved up. Uh, Moeller, which trades over in Denmark, probably the biggest shipping company in the world, just down 1%. Matt which is a Dow transport company, also a shipping company, just down fractionally here. Kirby, also a Dow transport company, very involved in energy shipping, oil shipping containers, also just down. These are fairly modest uh, declines that we're seeing uh, overall here. Airlines, another typical thing that you would see here when the higher oil prices, uh, American and Delta, a little more violent move there for American Deutsche uh, over uh, in Europe, Air France down about 6%, EasyJet. This is a little more noticeable in terms of what's going on. As always, folks, we talk about exchange-traded funds. There are ETFs associated with all of these. Here's your aerospace. This is ITA and defense sector, uh, up fractionally. Oil and gas, XOP is what you want to look at, and that's the sector that's being most affected today in terms of the energy complex. There is a shipping uh, ETF that's out there that shows all these global shipping companies uh, that I just talked about. About recently, that's S E A C is the symbol for that, and then there is a global airline ETF, J E T S, down 2.8 percent. But outside of the airline stocks and a couple shipping names, as you can see, fairly modest. Remember, we're fairly overbought right now here, so some big names that are out there are having the chance just to recalibrate a little, particularly some of those China stocks that we've seen really roaring. Remember, Alibaba hit a new high yesterday. Scott, back to you. 
Bob, appreciate it. Just something. I like Bob because it's still not that expensive. Pioneer PXD is the one if you want to spec. They could get bought. And they're doing well. Uh, that's the only spec in the group that I would go for. PXD, Pioneer. We're going to take a quick break, uh, give you another look at the markets where we've come uh, off the lows by a good amount. Dow's is still down 186. Major averages are all in the red, but not nearly as bad as the picture was very early this morning. Squawk on the street. We'll be right back. Bond report. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active. And get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it, run, skin, mix it, run, mix it, mix it. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. <laughs> but we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got- and Fox News Talk... The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line. It's intercepted. Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can, anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. The Kansas- Search NFL today. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Got a block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Welcome back. Give you a look at the Dow 30 heat map. One stock at this moment is in the green. What complex do you think that's from? The oil complex. Oil complex. It's Chevron. Everything else. Well, there's Boeing. Boeing just went into the green. Let's that's see if uh, incredible. any more do as well. We'll follow that. Of course, we'll take a quick break. Up next is Stop Trading with Jim. I'm Nat Coombs from ESPN's The Nat Coombs Show, which admittedly is 1 out of 10 for original podcast name, but 10 out of 10 for NFL chat. Every week, we're dropping four episodes with an all-pro lineup of terrific guests, journalists, comedians, players, coaches, you name it, all getting you up to speed with everything gridiron. The Nat Coombs Show, American football, British accent. Add to your favorites and listen on TuneIn. Hockey fans, 
Pistons. The 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a move, and a shot, From regular season action to the All-Star game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. To LeBron, slam dunk. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11-2. to The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big off-season trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. Want to tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap notify me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. Now, that's 800-850-3232 or followthesmartmoney.com. That's followthesmartmoney.com. My name is Claire, and I'm a 30-Day Fitness App user. I love home workouts and the ability to work out at my own pace. The 30-Day Fitness App is perfect for that. I love the fact that you can do it anywhere because you don't need equipment. My clothes even fit better. I haven't raised my prices since 2007. They reimagine, rebuild, and revive small businesses. Open! Holy f- Five-day biz fix, all new Wednesday, 10 Eastern. CNBC, get yours. At Credible.com, we've helped tens of thousands of people save money by refinancing their student loans. In three minutes, we'll get you actual rates from multiple lenders. We could save you hundreds of dollars a month. Visit Credible.com to see how much you could save. I got things I want to do, but student loans were holding me back. Credible.com helped me save $600 a month with a great rate. Now I can go do what I want to do. Visit Credible.com to see how much you could save on your student loans. This is Mary Ann's first time visiting Paris. Well, you... uh... Before Mary Ann packed her bags, before she attempted her first sentence in French, she downloaded Babbel. So when it came time to tell the cab driver to take her to the Hotel Pierre... J'aimerais aller à l'Hotel Pierre. Oh, c'est très bien. Babbel focuses on natural conversation. You can speak and pronounce with confidence. Start speaking a new language in three weeks. Try it for free at Babbel.com. Time now for Kramer and Stop Trading. I mentioned specs earlier, Pioneer. Here's one. L Brands, not my fave, but Bank of America says we are at the tipping point for, Vic, for Victoria's Secret. They might do something good. Uh, and most importantly, uh, Bath & Body Works, they say if they spin it off, it's worth a fortune. Now, uh, it, it's low risk. It's not my fave, but I'm giving specs out because I don't think it's a good day to do investments. I want people to wait until Monday at yeah. least. They're so anxious. People want to throw money at the market. That's never been good. You see the greed fear index? It's at the maximum greed, the CNN. I don't like that. Yeah, you've been, you've been back. suggesting uh, on Twitter, why buy so soon? Like, yeah. let, let it go down a little bit. Yeah, there's some guys there, a bunch of sparkies that want to what, buy uh, right here. What do you got on Madden Night? I have a very exciting thing. I have crowds. <laughs> right. I am a huge... Based cyber- in Sunnyvale, California. Yeah. I, I am a huge cybersecurity guy. All this does, the attack in a ram, you know, people want to buy north of Grumman. Go buy cybersecurity. That's what these guys do. That's what North Korea does. That's what Iran does. They hack us. So you need companies like CrowdStrike. I really like CrowdStrike, by the way. I like Palo Alto Networks, too. Because they're reforming their situation. No, I had them on, and I, 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 I did not speak positively. And I know they are doing great things at Palo Alto. They're changing the company. Great to have you back. We'll see you on Mad tonight. I love being back. Yeah, it's good to have you back. This vacation stuff, so I'm <laughs> No, it's not. No? <laughs> no it's good to oh, be back, though. That's Jim Cramer. We'll see him tonight. All right, when we come back, more reaction to the U.S. airstrike that killed a top Iranian commander. What's at stake for stocks and oil prices? Also ahead, Chicago Fed President Charles Evans. Keep it right here. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Makes it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Makes, makes it up. Lift. Makes it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run.
It's crunch time. Skip it makes it jump. Run. Makes it add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix it makes it jump. Skip. Makes it run. Makes it With my little eye, something beginning with B. Um, bike. Nope. Banana tree. Oh, of course. We must have missed it. Although you might not be able to see it, your small actions can have a real impact with Shell. Drive carbon neutral by filling up and using Shell Go Plus today. Make the change. Drive carbon neutral. Shell. Go well. See goplus.shell.com slash CO2 for details. This is not a cat. This is not a rocket, and this is not a sale. That's right. At Smarty Mobile, we're not having a sale. While others are slashing prices, we're introducing our best ever new plans. Take our new 30 gig data SIM for just £10 a month. With unlimited calls and texts and no speed restrictions, credit checks or contract tying you down, why shop around? New plans, great value. Now that's Smarty. Grab yours today. Search Smarty Mobile. See smarty.co.uk for terms. Good Friday morning. Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. I'm Scott Wapner along with Contessa Brewer and Mike Santoli. We are live from Post 9 at the New York Stock Exchange. Carl, Sarah, and David all have the morning off. We'll take a look at the markets right now. Did open lower and we're still hanging out. Uh, off the worst levels of the morning, though, Dow still down by nearly 220, three quarters of 1%. S&P down 23, also around that same percentage loss. And there's the NASDAQ still able to hold on to 9,000, uh, down a little bit more than the other uh, averages, about uh, you know a little more than three quarters of, of 1%. All right, so our roadmap this morning begins with a U.S. drone strike killing a top Iranian commander overnight in Baghdad. We tell you which sectors to watch this hour as the stock sell-off continues. Plus, the view from the Federal Reserve. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans joins us in just a few minutes. Looking forward to that. And airlines getting slammed as oil prices spike. Today's biggest movers are straight ahead. But first, we've got economic data crossing the tape. ISM Manufacturing Index for December coming in at 47.2 compared to a consensus estimate of 49. And the government is out with November construction spending up six-tenths of a percent. Economists had been looking for an increase of four-tenths of one percent. Um, interesting on the data there. Another miss on manufacturing. Another miss. ISM has been stubbornly weak relative to other measures. We'll see how the market uh, kind of absorbs all of that. Uh, but now down to Washington and the latest on the U.S. drone strike. Eamon Javers joins us for that. Hi, Eamon. Yeah, good morning, Mike. The president taking to Twitter just within the past hour to offer his rationale now for the U.S. airstrike in Baghdad that killed the leader of the Iranian Quds Force, one of the highest level Iranian military and political officials. The president saying General Qasem Soleimani has killed or badly wounded thousands of Americans over an extended period of time and was plotting to kill many more but got caught. He was directly and indirectly responsible for the death of millions of people, including the recent large number of protesters killed in Iran itself. While Iran will never be able to properly admit it, Soleimani was both hated and feared within the country. They are not nearly as saddened as the leaders will let the outside world believe. He should have been taken out many years ago. So the president there, Mike, suggesting uh, that he believes that the reaction to this airstrike inside Iran may be more muted than many people around the world expect from the Iranian regime because of his political unpopularity within the country. We'll see whether that uh, remains the case. The Iranians have vowed revenge uh, for the killing. Uh, They suggest they will respond in some way. The president, meanwhile, is in Mar-a-Lago, Florida today. He's not expected to be seen before cameras until later this evening when he has an event uh, before an evangelical group in Florida. So we might hear more from him at that point. But that's his statement on Twitter as of now for why he took this action last night, Mike. Eamon, thank you very much. Uh, Oil prices are surging as the situation in the Middle East develops. John Kilda, founding partner at Again Capital and a CNBC contributor, joins us now, along with former U.S. Army Brigadier General and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Middle East Policy, Mark Kimmett. Uh, Good morning to you both. General, uh, I'd love to start with you in terms of how we should think about What to be prepared for, next steps, either Iranian response, what it means in the near term for the region uh, at this point. Yeah, there certainly will be an Iranian response. uh, Despite what the the president's tweet said, uh, Qasem Soleimani was 
very, very popular inside of Iran. He was a national hero. He was very effective outside of Iran, too, uh, creating turbulence throughout the region. Uh, so the Iranians have a lot of reason to strike back. I expect them to. I don't expect them to do it in any way that we've seen thus far. Uh, they may use drones. They may use cyber attack. But they are masters at doing the unexpected. And uh, they have much reason to wreak revenge on, on uh, the countries around the region in general, the Americans in those countries in particular. John, uh, we talk about the, uh, the response in terms of the crude oil market. Um, crude also uh, had been uh, at a relative high, right, at the upper end of its range. Uh, how does it change the calculus, if at all, in terms of supply-demand for the world? In terms of lost barrels right now, nothing's really changed, Mike. It's, it's the uh, fear premium that we talk about from time to time that rises and falls with the various tensions that are inherent uh, to the Middle East. What the general is just referring to, the expected attack, where does that take us? And in my view, the biggest vulnerability for world oil supplies comes from Iraq. Iraq has been and I think will continue to be the battleground, particularly the southern export facilities in Basra which could uh, be easily uh, attacked by Iranian proxies, which they are masterful at. And when, right now, I mean, would you characterize the response in terms of the markets as, as relatively modest or muted, or is this uh, have the, the possibility of, of getting a little bit uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, unhinged to the upside in terms yeah, of price? Yeah, I, I think right now it's certainly muted. I mean, to be only up $2 a barrel on this, because we're in new territory here. This is an escalation uh, that uh, we've never really encountered. Keep in mind, the, the attack on Abcake in Saudi Arabia last year, late last year, there was no necessarily claim of responsibility for that. This is a direct move by the U.S. on Iran that invites a counter uh, strike. General, just to uh, go through some of your bona fides here, you've been the director of operations for coalition forces in Iraq. You were the deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East. In, in your experience, uh, if you cut off the head of a revolutionary force like this, what is likely to be the response of this armed militia? Well, I think the militia... The Quds Force, which is an Iranian force, and the militias that they control inside of Iraq, I think that's where you're going to expect the response to come from. They've instantly announced a replacement for Qasem Soleimani, uh, but nobody was better and will be better than Qasem Soleimani. I would make one point on the last, the last guest comment. I don't think that they're going to attack the Iraqi oil fields. Uh, they understand that they have a chance now to extend their influence well into Iraq, well beyond what they've already had. I think more likely they might go for the Gulf oil, the offshore platforms in the Persian Gulf that are owned by Kuwait. But I, I wouldn't predict that the attacks would be in Basra, but I could be wrong. I would, uh, yeah, I would just say that um, to the extent the Iranians want to try to inflict maximum economic pain on the West, that's certainly one way to do it. I mean, they have the resources on the ground there, but, uh, you know, I, of course, have to defer to the general. General, um, former National Security Advisor John Bolton suggesting this morning on Twitter that he hopes this ultimately leads to regime change in Iran. Do you think that's where U.S. policy is now heading? Uh, definitely not. I don't think, uh, I mean, John, John, or Bolton for years and years has been very much an Iran hawk. Uh, I don't think that we're uh, aiming for, and I don't think we want to be in the business of regime change inside of Iran. We haven't done that very well in the region over the past couple of decades. Uh, but however, if it is an organic change of the regime by the Iranian people themselves, that's a different story. So, General, are you looking at this um, opportunity for Iran to take revenge or strike back as a short-term threat, a medium-term threat? Are you, can you give me a timeline on where you would see that the, the United States and perhaps other allies have got to harden their facilities and, and keep an eye out? Yeah, I think it's an immediate threat. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in Iraq has already put out a statement that says all Americans need to leave Iraq as quickly as possible, either through the airport or overland. Uh, I would expect a near-term response from militias inside of Iraq who have seen their leader get killed, uh, and then maybe a mid-term attack uh, from the Iranian uh, country proper. And obviously, I mean, current um, you know, U.S. military leaders must also anticipate something like this. I mean, do you think yep. that this is going to go back and forth a bit, or, or would that type of response uh, essentially be considered uh, you know, to be the expected one, and then they would not further escalate from there? 
Look, I, I know the Department of Defense, the Department of State well. I, I know they would not have done this attack unless they had thought three moves ahead on uh, what they would do if there was a counter response. This is the advantage of the attacker. At this point, we have the initiative. We're going to control uh, the responses, uh, not the Iranians. Uh, hopefully, however, we'll see everybody moderate and we'll see this calm down considerably because uh, this could escalate significantly and put the entire region, as your guest said, in turbulence. How, how long do you think this really upsets the, the oil market? I mean, all things considered, what just happened overnight, I, I would say years ago, would have had a much more dramatic impact on the price of oil. A $2 move, to me, suggests that it's somewhat muted and may not last very long if that's all you got from the magnitude of something that we just did. Right, and it's a rational response to Scott, right? Because there's no lost oil. As a matter of fact, we are in an oversupplied market. OPEC is working hard to reduce the supply overhang. Back in the day, if you want to call it that, we needed every barrel. We couldn't afford to, to lose a barrel from Saudi Arabia or anywhere else. We weren't pumping out 12 million barrels a day down in Texas or the entire country for that, for that matter. So we, we now have this firewall thanks to the U.S. production that we did not have before. However, with Venezuela offline, Iran offline, we are getting to the point where we can't afford to lose much more. We can't knock, we can't keep knocking these OPEC producers off the table and think that we're going to have you know 250, 250 a gallon gasoline for long. So we're getting to the edge, but we're not there yet, and that's why you're seeing the price reaction the way it is. The oil market's memory is short, and we're we're hyper focused on the supply balance, and it remains robust. All right, John, thank you very much, General thank Kimmett. Thank you for your time this morning. Sure. So, so ahead on, just walk on the street. The stocks to watch amid today's sell-off. But first, a rare interview with Chicago Fed President Charles Evans. Steve Leisman has that. And Steve, what's coming up after the break? Contessa, I'm live in San Diego at the American Economic Association Annual Conference. I'll be talking with Charlie Evans, the Chicago Fed President, about rising global uncertainty, along with the outlook for the economy and Fed policy in 2020. And that's when Squawk on the Street comes right back. This CNBC program. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it. You don't just live in one room, so why should you Wi-Fi? With Sky Broadband's Wi-Fi guarantee, you'll get Wi-Fi in every room or money back. Perfect for food shopping in the bedroom, gaming in your PJs in the lounge, or streaming sci-fi movies in the kitchen. Get Sky's super fast broadband and Wi-Fi guarantee. £32 a month for 18 months with 1995 setup. Click on the banner now. Sky Fiber Areas, Sky Kit required. Refund or boost component of subscription pay during current minimum term up to date of claim. Minimum 3 megabits per second or money back. Prices may change during minimum term. See sky.com slash guarantee. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open 3, DeAndre Hunter got it! And off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Be better informed, be better prepared. The Better Network is on Tune In. This is Brent Musburger. Search B-E-T-R and start hanging out with me and my guys in the desert weekday afternoons. The Better Network is now on Tune In. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial-free. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. 
slam dunk. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big offseason trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. Let's get over to Steve Leisman now at the American Economic Association Conference, sitting down with a special guest. Hi, Steve. Good morning, Contessa. Uh, live here from San Diego with Charlie Evans, Chicago Fed President. Uh, Charlie, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Steve. I know these are overnight developments, and uh, you haven't a chance to think too much about them, but it's a time uh, this morning of rising global uncertainty, uh, higher oil prices. Tell me how you process all that. Well, I think it's very early. I mean, obviously, events just happened last night, and uh, <clears throat> so I haven't had a chance to look at... Uh, uh, the market data. I guess oil prices are up. There must be uh, more uncertainty, and uh, I think we're just going to have to, um, you know, see how this uh, works its way out. I mean, at the moment, I think the fundamentals for the U.S. economy are good. Uh, the labor market is strong, so I, I think we're in a pretty good position there. And this becomes a matter of how long the uncertainty continues, how long right. oil prices remain high, depending right. upon the economic effect they'll have. That's right. Um, let's talk about the outlook for 2020. These are early days of the year. Um, 2% has been the number that you've been talking about. Is it still the number that you're expecting? What are we talking, GDP or inflation? Well, you tell me. <laughs> See, I mean, both are, both are sort of relevant there. Uh, you know, like I said, I think the economic fundamentals right. are good. The uh, labor market is strong. Unemployment's at 3.5%. Uh, trend growth, I think, is 1 and 3 quarters percent. I'm looking for 2 to 2 and a quarter percent growth in 2020. So I think, again, above trend growth. Maybe we'll get luckier. Maybe the uncertainties will uh, hurt us a little bit there, too. But uh, So I think growth is good. I'm expecting labor markets to stay strong, the consumer. So I think it's an environment where inflation ought to be rising up to 2%. I think with the unemployment rate at 3.5%, uh, very long and uh, successful recovery, we really ought to be getting inflation above 2% to show that it's a symmetric objective. And if it goes up to 25 quarter, 25 that would be all right with me. Back in November, you talked about being more aggressive in terms of hitting that inflation target. Do you still believe that? Well, I think that uh, we've been underrunning our 2% objective for a long time, and we've said for quite some time that we've got a 2% objective. It's symmetric, and I think after a while, people have to start wondering, are you going to hit the 2% objective? Now, there are a number of reasons why uh, you know, headwinds have been in the way, uh, but golly, the unemployment rate has gone down to 3.5%. The economy's doing well. The way that we would normally think about what should lead to inflation, we should have seen inflation. So there must be so much more at work that maybe we need more accommodative monetary policy. I think our current setting is accommodative. I think uh, uh, the FOMC has uh, positioned us well uh, for 2020. Uh, we've got some risk management uh, positioning in the current setting, and I think it's one where inflation can go up above 2%. That's without uh, you know any oil you're... price sure. uncertainties, which obviously put uh, another story into play. Let's say we get to June and you're still not there yet. Would you be considering additional accommodation? I think that's a fair question. I think I'd uh, need to see exactly how the data are playing out. I think staying at where we are is a very good thing. I think a lot of people might kind of wonder, can you really stay at one and a half to one and three quarters percent if the unemployment rate stays where we are? But without inflationary pressures, I think that uh, this is a very good setting. Troy, sure, this is a fascinating time where essentially you guys are feeling your way to knowing what the unemployment, how low unemployment can go. Um, are you willing to just let it ride down if uh, it, 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 keeping policy where it is? Is 3% or below 3% unemployment rate something that you'd be willing to test? I think that's a great question. I think I, the way you pose it and feeling our way down, I think that uh, we certainly have seen the unemployment rate fall from very high levels. And as we've gotten to certain points along the way, many of us have kind of gone, oh, geez, we must be pretty close to the natural rate. And then we keep going lower. Oh, it must Without actually, inflation. it actually must be lower. Oh, there's no inflation. We kept expecting right. we would see inflation. Um, you know, 6% at one point might have been, are we going to improve upon that? You know, Nariana Coach Lakota said we ought to be targeting five and a half. That was how long? ago and we're still you know below this and so i think that we need to be keeping our eyes on inflation uh defending promoting the symmetric two percent inflation objective showing that we can get there and i think the unemployment rate 
it's it's a wonderful thing. I think more people are engaged in uh, the workforce, uh, uh, gaining skills, uh, improving their uh, relationship with the labor market. People who previously didn't have those opportunities uh, as much, and so I, I think structurally it's a good thing too. But we really need to keep our eye on inflation, and unless inflation starts going up to something that is inconsistent with our 2% symmetric inflation objective, I think we're pretty good, well set for Charlie, policy. Is it, is it riskless to run this experiment? Are there concerns that you have uh, that, hey, we can just keep interest rates low, we can see how low unemployment goes, and if it gets too too low, we can we can reverse course. Is it a riskless experiment? Well, there are always risks. Uh, that's the easy answer to a question like that. There's, there's risks on, on both sides. I don't see us running an experiment where we're trying to get the unemployment rate lower, lower, lower. I think in the moment, uh, I think the setting of monetary policy with the things that we're facing, you know, three and a half percent unemployment is likely to continue. It might go up a little bit. It might go down a little bit. But I think it's much more likely to be stable given the growth rates of uh, GDP that we're, you know, kind of expecting. So I don't see a big risk there. Now, um, you know, you do hear many comments about the financial instability risks and with lower for longer uh, rates, does that uh, add a little effervescence in places where we don't need it? We're monitoring that very carefully. I think that uh, the, the, the Board of Governors in Washington has been reevaluating the stance of supervisory regulatory policies and making judgments that, uh, you know, we can be in a position. We've got good capital, uh, more and better capital, and, uh, you know, let's let the economy uh, continue to expand. I've got two more areas I want to get to real quickly. First of all, the ISM number came out again showing contraction in the manufacturing sector. Your district heavy in manufacturing. Right. What are you hearing and seeing there? Well, I think we've seen a lot of uh, uncertainty associated with uh, tariff policies, uh, not knowing exactly where uh, supply chains can be positioned, uh, whether or not they have to be moved. I think that the uh, agricultural setting, uh, uh, not being able to export as many uh, soybeans and and, um, and, and pork as, as, as they would like. So I, I think the manufacturing sector has definitely been uh, hit. I mean, the agriculture affects uh, heavy equipment manufacturers. You know, farmers don't need to buy the combines and, and all right. of that. I mean, so I think both factors in your district. Right, exactly. So I think, uh, you know, we've definitely seen uh, those, those factors um, play out. Um, I think what we're kind of finding is that the economy can continue to expand with a modest contraction in the manufacturing sector at the moment. The consumer is playing a strong role. Business right. investment has not been uh, strong at all, but the consumer has been strong enough. As long as that stays in place, I think we can continue to, to see growth to two and a quarter percent. But of course, you know, we can't we can't withstand everything. Right. Uh, but I think we're well positioned. Charlie, one more thing talking about being well positioned. Uh, everybody was worried about the overnight lending market over the turn, over the, the first of the year, right. it seemed like that rate was well controlled. Right. Um, does the Federal Reserve have to have, or should it have, what they call a standing repo facility? You've been doing temporary stuff. Uh, okay. Should it become a standing repo facility so that it's there for good? I see. We could talk for quite some time about but that. Not, I think, let's yeah, exactly. Sure. So, so I think a standing, a standing facility is something that uh, many central banks have, the ECB right. uh, and others, and so it's something that the, the Fed has contemplated. We could decide to make a judgment to put a standing facility in place. I think there are a number of parameters as to, you know, what's the interest rate that it's offered at and right. uh, take up and things like that. That would be important. Another alternative would just be to have a larger balance sheet so that you've always got enough reserves in the system. I think at the moment we've sort of tried to uh, reposition our reserves so that they're uh, more ample uh, back to the September of, of last year uh, levels. There are some uh, treasury events, uh, tax events coming up in the spring, and uh, we want to make sure that we have uh, the right amount of reserves in place. But if you go after a more efficient level of reserves that's somewhat lower than we've been experiencing for sure, and you know, you might imagine having a standing repo facility could help out in those Over moments yeah. where all of a sudden uh, dealer brokers need access to those kinds of funds. Charlie, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks, Steve. Charles Evans, Chicago Fed President. Uh, back to you guys from the AEA conference where, uh, by the way, 13,000 economists and students here in San Diego for this conference. Scott. Yeah, conference, in quotes, that, that live shot. Nice live shot, Steve. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. All right, let's get some reaction to that interview ahead of today's Fed Minutes. Princeton's Alan Blinder joins us now, the former vice chairman of the Fed. Uh, Mr. Blinder, it's good to have you this morning. Charlie Evans just said pretty well set with policy where, where, with inflation where it is. Uh, is he right? Do you think policy is in a good, a good place? I think it's in a very good place, maybe surprisingly good. It wasn't so obvious when the Fed started pushing interest rates down that that was the right thing to do. Now it's looking pretty good. 
we've got the interest rate around almost exactly where the inflation rate is, so a zero um, real federal funds rate, which is a push, which most of us think of as being slightly aggressive, not grotesquely aggressive, slightly aggressive. And that was the fear that some people had when the Fed started moving down. But, you know, the inflation rate has not budged, basically, as Evans said. And as long as it doesn't budge and the economy keeps trundling along at 2% or so growth, I think the Fed is just going to stand pat indefinitely, as long as that lasts. He seems surprised by the fact that inflation hasn't budged. Said it ought to be rising. A lot of people agree with him. Sounds like you do as well. Why do you think it isn't? I do. I wish I knew, you know. Uh, that's the $64 trillion question. That's the question that Jerome Powell and his colleagues go to bed every night uh, pondering. Nobody really knows the answer. There are a few little straws in the wind about the composition of the uh, unemployed, about whether workers are getting um, benefits that are not showing up in wages. For example, Charlie alluded to this very obliquely, but you see um, hiring standards falling, people that don't necessarily have the greatest work experience um, are getting hired anyway, whereas in a labor market that was weaker, they wouldn't be. So I think some of it is coming out that way. But don't get me wrong. I don't think we have a full explanation of this. I think it's a big mystery. Uh, Alan, you know, you were at the Fed at this golden moment in the mid-90s that we keep hearkening right. back to when there was this, right. uh, I guess, recognition over time that, in fact, uh, unemployment could go lower than we previously thought without producing inflation. There were right. three rate cuts right. in 95. You know the whole history, of course. But does it yep. feel like there's a rerun of that episode happening? Um... Yes, sort of, but much more extreme. I mean, back in the day, uh, I got criticized in 94 when I was vice chairman of the Fed for suggesting we could push the unemployment rate below six. I didn't say a number like five or four. People would have thought I was crazy then. And frankly, in 94, I didn't believe we could go that low uh, safely. It turned out that we could. Uh, this episode is even more extreme. We've got the unemployment rate down below four for quite a long time. And the Fed, as Charlie Evans just pointed out, is still trying to push inflation up, not, not hold it back. So, yes, similar, but even more so these days. Alan, you know, they spoke about the, the fact that manufacturing remains weak. So much expectation continues to be put on the back of the consumer. Is there a point where we need to start worrying about the, the manufacturing prolonged weakness? I think the answer is yes, but mostly regionally. As Steve pointed out in his interview with Charlie Evans, there are regions of the country where manufacturing is a bigger deal than in some other regions. So I, you want to think of this as most, mostly sectoral. Manufacturing, you could say... <laughs> Excuse me. Manufacturing, you could say, is in a recession. So if you're in a region of the country which is heavily into manufacturing, or certainly, especially the sorts of manufacturing that are impinged upon by this trade mess, uh, you're in a recession, actually, even though the rest of the economy is uh, in a boom. The answer is manufacturing is a relatively small share of employment. It's down below 10%. So... One way to phrase your question is, could the rest of the 90% still do well, even when the 10% is not doing so well? I think the answer to that is yes, if you look at the whole country. I'm curious, since we rely so heavily on the American consumer as a driver of this economy, will this strike uh, in Iraq last night um, against Iran do anything to the American consumer? Or I'm looking at gas futures right now um, up more than 3%. At one point this morning, they were up 4.5%. If gas prices rise, won't that take away some of the spending power the American consumer has? I think so. I think that's the biggest question right now by far because of the developments in the Middle East um, last night. Uh, we don't know where that's going, how big it's going to be. Uh, 
as a geopolitical event. It may be, turn out to be quite big or maybe it won't. And therefore, we of course don't know what it will be as an economic event. But the direction that you're talking about is exactly right. To the ex If we imagine this blows up into a very big, quote, oil shock, and people see uh, pump prices of gasoline and home heating oil prices and things like that uh, skyrocketing, that will put a dent, first of all, into the pocketbook, exactly as you said, for buying other things, but also into confidence. That's the kind of thing that can shake people up. And it's, as Charlie Evans, I think, said in the interview, it's just way too early to make any judgments about that. But it has, well, it's not too early to say, this has now jumped to the top of the worry list. Trade frictions right. have been at the top of the worry list for a long time. This has now leapfrogged it. Alan, we appreciate your time this morning. Happy New Year. We'll talk to you soon. That's Alan Blinder. Happy New Year us. to you. Thank you. And stocks backing off uh, in a relatively big way as oil prices continue to spike. Airlines among the worst performing stocks in the S&P 500. You see right there, uh, American down almost 5%. Marathon Petroleum outside the uh, airline industry down 4.5%. A lot more squawk in the street. Still ahead. Stay with us. Nobody would be crazy enough. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time, skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it, run, skin, mix it, run, mix it, mix it. Having to deal with financial stuff can make you feel... Ah! But at Money Supermarket, we make you feel... Ah! That's because we go further to help you get money calm. We don't just compare. We cut prices to help you get better car insurance deals. Get money car. Money super. Market. On the goal line. Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. The move, and a shot, they score! From regular season action to the All-Star game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. To LeBron, slam! The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big offseason trade, sending Anthony Davis to LA. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip off is at 10 30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest additions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sue Herrera. Here's your CNBC News update at this hour. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has warned the U.S. that, quote, harsh retaliation is waiting for the killing of Qasem Soleimani, the leader of that country's elite Quds force. He eulogized him as the international face of resistance. Iranians, meantime, took to the streets to mourn the killing of Iran's top general. They gathered with signs reading down with the U.S. and chanted anti-U.S. slogans. Soleimani was the architect of Tehran's proxy wars in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu cutting short a visit to Greece to follow the ongoing developments. Before leaving, he said President Trump deserves all the credit for acting swiftly, forcefully and decisively. Just as Israel has the right of self-defense, the United States has exactly the same right. Qasem Soleimani is responsible for the death of American citizens and many other innocent people. He was planning more such attacks. 
You are up to date. It's a busy do- news day. That's the news update. Contessa, back to you. All right, Sue, thank you for that. When we come back, the sectors we are watching as we close out the first trading days of 2020. Squawk on the Street will be right back. Don't go away. Whether you've enjoyed the legendary terrain in Telluride. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix Mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix Mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix mix it up. Skip. Mix it up. Run. Mix it Mix it Oh, a decent drill would make DIY so much easier. Whether you're laying flooring or fitting shelves, head to the B&Q Tool Shop. Get hands-on in store with our wide range of drills, including the Bosch Universal Impact Combi Drill for just £80. The B&Q Tool Shop. You can do it when you're being cute. Hey, it's me again, the TV. Since my family gave me Now TV, there's no more endlessly searching for something they want to watch because now I don't do filler TV, just killer TV. If my family want movies, I've got blockbusters. Football, how about the Premier League? Or crime dramas, I've got loads. And they're never going to guess who did it. Now they can watch whatever they're in the mood for. What's your TV got for you tonight? Now TV. 18 plus, month passes auto renew, terms apply. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. (laughs) But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk... The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. The Dow, the Nasdaq, the S&P all off about three quarters of a percentage point. Oil up about three and a half percent. Is an extended sell-off ahead as geopolitical tensions rise in the Middle East following that strike on an air base in Baghdad. Joining us now is Horizons Investments, Scott Ladner and Safanad's John Rutledge. Gentlemen, good to have you with us today. Good morning. Uh, Scott, let me begin with you. You come into today talking about how a lot of the geopolitical tension has eased, what with uh, a trade deal looming and and, uh, a Brexit insight. Does this attack on an Iranian militia guard do anything to change your outlook for 2020? Well, it certainly makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, we didn't, we did have a lot of known unknowns in 2019 that basically got resolved in a pro-growth fashion, uh, for the most part. Um, this certainly throws a wrench in some of that. We don't think it's going to escalate uh, a ton, but it is very early stages, and so it does uh, is one more thing that we need to think about coming into the first part of this year. All right, John, what's your take on what happened in Iraq and and how it might play out for your thesis for 2020? Well, I have to admit, my first thought was I've flown over that airport twice in the last month, and I'm glad it wasn't today. But uh, I think it just uh, illustrates that we are very, very fragile subject to event risks. And, uh, you know, economy's fine. The growth in the market in the last year has been all fed, no profits. Uh, we've, uh, we're, the profits are not looking very good going forward. So I like the idea of just being careful and being uh, being defensive, lest we wake up another morning and find out three more things have gone by. That means you'll miss a little bit of the remaining ups on whatever this uh, market is, but that's okay. You know, I'm too old to make this money back. Well, you're suggesting, John, that the multiple expansion that we had that caused the market to, to go up as much as it did um, this past year can't be repeated, that it's, that it's not sustainable. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's entirely caused by uh, central banks flooding the market with liquidity. But they can do that. And uh, I, earlier I heard Steve down from the AEA convention in San Diego. You know, in 1967, Milton Friedman, rest his soul, explained to us that if central banks print money forever, sooner or later prices go up and sooner or later interest rates go up too. When rates go up, multiples fall. That was the 1970s. So we should be paying more attention 
uh, to the multiples. And in the world of private equity and real estate, that read that as exit multiples. If you're going to be buying something today, make sure that you look at selling it in a couple, three years at one or two multiples lower than we have today. Uh, Scott, I guess another way of, uh, of looking at it is that profits in the U.S. have basically held flat at record levels in the last year. And obviously, investors are uh, feeling like they can try to handicap a return to growth. Now, today we did get a, another weak ISM manufacturing number. I yeah. don't know if that changes the market's calculus, Scott, but uh, how are you reading it? Well, I mean, it is, it is again, we are, we are expecting a return to more robust growth uh, this, this year. Um, you know, last year, the, the dominant narrative was everything was late cycle. And that was the investing narrative. That was the, uh, you know, the market narrative. Everybody assumed that was just the case. It was a starting point. Um, it turned out that we were probably a little bit more mid-cycle than we, than we are late cycle. We had a little bit of a slowdown in the U.S., uh, but things out of China and stimulus from the, both the Fed and the Chinese, uh, both the monetary and fiscal side last year, are going to start to bear fruits this year. And the market, obviously, is a discounting mechanism. And so we rallied in the fourth quarter. Um, but that rally is, is by no means done, we don't think. Uh, we, we think there's, there's plenty, to, plenty more to go, especially in the first half of this year, before we can get to a place where we have irrational exuberance or anything really, uh, really toppy in the markets. John, you, you sort of take issue with, with the market, saying it's all Fed, it's not sustainable. Uh, the Fed's policy, though, is sustainable, and it doesn't look like they're going to do anything anytime soon. Rates are going to remain low. Charlie Evans just said the economy's in a good place. What's there to be negative about Charlie Evans said he wasn't sure whether they had enough reserves in order to manage the liquidity issues. Maybe they should have a bigger balance sheet. In other words, we're in QE4 uh, okay. already. Even you're painting, you're painting a picture central, even more so why stocks could go up, right? Yeah, but only, only temporarily. I mean, printing money is not a panacea for making stocks rise long term. It's, it gives you lower uh, discount rates and higher prices in the short term. I don't think that is sustainable. Uh, uh, Scott, what do you think is going to be the big driver of 2020? Do you think it continues to be whether the Fed keeps the hands off, whether there's liquidity, whether earnings are the driver, as we've seen so many people count on? Or do you think these geopolitical tensions end up being the big what ifs that come into play? You know, I do think it's going to be a lot about the Fed and a lot about policy. Uh, so the, the, the deregulatory policy of the Trump administration doesn't get enough credit for what it's, what, for what it's doing to this economy. Sure. Um, the, sure. the change in the Fed, uh, that, you know, the, the change we're talking about in the Fed in terms of having more of an average inflation target is getting not nearly enough play. That is a really important policy shift from the Fed if they go that way. It's, you know, they're trying to prevent this idea that we can't produce inflation even if we want it. Um, you know, they're, they're, that's, that's pushing back against the Japanese model that you know, we know what that looks like. We know what that model looks like. If you can't produce inflation as a central banker, that's probably the most dangerous place you can be. So the Fed's pushing back against that. All that means, though, is though it's really important. It, it means that we're going to have a much more dovish policy stance out of the Fed for a much longer period of time. That's not something that I think you want to fight as an investor. Scott, John, gentlemen, thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Still ahead, why airline stocks are getting crushed in today's session. Squawk on the Street returns with that in two minutes. The world's boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run. Mix it, mix it. This is not a cat. This is not a rocket. And this is not a sail. That's right. At Smarty Mobile, we're not having a sale. While others are slashing prices, we're introducing our best ever new plans. Take our new 30 gig data SIM for just £10 a month. With unlimited calls and texts and no speed restrictions, credit checks or contract tying you down, why shop around? New plans, great value. Now that's Smarty. Grab yours today. Search Smarty Mobile. See smarty.co.uk for terms. Hey, it's me again, the TV. Since my family gave me Now TV, there's no more endlessly searching for something they want to watch because now I don't do filler TV, just killer TV. If my family want movies, I've got blockbusters. Football? How about the Premier League? 
or crime dramas, I've got loads. And they're never going to guess who did it. Now they can watch whatever they're in the mood for. What's your TV got for you tonight? Now TV. 18 plus, month passes, auto renew, terms apply. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial free. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Stocks kicking off the new year at records, but one top economist says it's not as good as Wall Street thinks. Find out more on tradingnation.cnbc.com. More squawk in the street is coming up. So Schwab, tell me about... Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. What? With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. The Keenan- Search NFL today. Smart Sports Wagering Talk is now on TuneIn. This is Brent Musburger. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Search B-E-T-R. Be better informed. Be better prepared. And remember, cash and tickets is what it's all about. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Airliners among those under the most pressure this morning as stocks continue to sell off. Phil LeBeau has more for us from Chicago. Hey, Phil. Scott, we're seeing the airline stocks down anywhere between 25 and maybe 4.5%. As you take a look at the major airlines, keep in mind that jet fuel, it's the second largest expense that they have after labor costs. And one reason why this spike is catching some airline stocks and hitting them a little bit harder is because Frankly, they've enjoyed a very benign environment over the last couple of years when it comes to jet fuel prices. In fact, jet fuel has been generally trending slightly lower over the last couple of years. And as a result, for the airlines, they've had that certainty when it comes to the cost side of the uh, ledger sheet when it comes to jet fuel prices. Now, keep in mind, especially as you take a look at like United, Delta, and American, not only are they facing the prospect of higher jet fuel prices, but the other thing to keep in mind, Contessa, is the fact that all of these airlines are moving into a year or two period here where they're going to have higher labor costs as their labor contracts come up. So if you're an investor, you are looking at these guys saying, hmm, okay, do we expect as much growth as we've seen over the last couple of years? Uh, Phil, how much are you factoring into their play in travel and leisure more broadly? I mean, we're seeing travel warnings now for Americans in the Middle right. East. Uh, we, we saw travel and leisure stocks under pressure in Europe throughout the day. Uh, I, w- I don't think that's a big factor at this point, primarily because the airlines, they don't see that type of an impact unless it's extended over a period of time. In other words, if you go back and you look at past incidents like this over the last several years, yeah, you'll hear some people say, well, this could be troubling for the travel and leisure industry. But unless it's an extended period of time, Contessa, it really doesn't hit these guys that hard. Phil LeBeau, thank you, Phil. You bet. All right, let's take a look now at the uh, markets and how they're performing today after we've been following that breaking news about the strike on an Iranian general for the Revolutionary Guard of the Quds Force. The Dow Jones Industrials off of their lows, uh, now down 200 points. It looks like the S&P 500 is off half a percent or so. The NASDAQ is off half a percent, but oil is at three and a half percent. Let's get to John Fort now with a look at what's coming up on Squawk Alley. John? Good morning, Contessa. Well, we continue to keep the geopolitical issues in focus with an eye on tech. Apple recently cracking 300 bucks a share. Where do it and the other tech powers go from here? We'll watch that as well coming up on Squawk Alley. If you listen to the political debate in this country... Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. 
So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it up, run, mix it, mix it You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a shot, they score! From regular season action to the All-Star game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Search NFL today. Stocks falling this morning, but off the lows of the session after a U.S. airstrike killed Iran's top military leader. Crude oil prices spiking today. And joining us now, Rapid Energy Group's head of geopolitical risk and former CIA officer Scott Modell. Also with us, Evercore ISI energy analyst Doug Terrison. He is on the phone with us today. Uh, Scott, I'm going to begin with you. Just sort of give us your view about what happened last night and what you think it means for the region and how we should be thinking today about the energy complex. Uh, Hi, good morning. Uh, What happened last night, I think, was a game changer for the region. I think Iran uh, was in a long trial and error process of testing Donald Trump. And I think they realized that they got a very strong message that you cannot cross his red lines. I think they're going to have to respond, but I think they're going to be very calibrated and careful. I think the tendency is to think that there's going to be a quick Iranian response, a major retaliation. We would discount that possibility. We think that there is certainly... Uh, uh, the risk that things could uh, miscalculate. Uh, But in reality, I think that the Iranians are going to be very, very cautious. We do know that they have additional attack plans uh, on the shelf to do, uh, to to look at uh, more attacks on oil infrastructure. But I would expect an Iranian response, just not a major retaliation. They do not want direct war with with, uh, with the United States. Do do you expect then this move that we've seen in oil prices this morning to be short-lived? Uh, well, I, you know, I've got to say, before Soleimani's assassination, we did not see too much geopolitical risk premium in the price of oil. After the assassination, you've seen the price increase. And, uh, you know, again, given the possibility that Iran w- is likely to attack again, uh, even though they're going to be cautious about not crossing Trump's red lines, uh, I do think that you're going to see more, there's certainly more risk that you could see prices continue to rise. Yeah. Doug, um, crude's been going up. Stocks can't get out of their own way, though. Why can't these stocks rise along with the price of crude? And if they can't now, when will they? Well, that, that's a good question. And, you know, we, we, we too believe that oil price is going to be a little bit stronger. But, you know, you're right, Scott. There's been a disconnect between the oil market and energy stocks in recent years. And it's really because because big oil, EMP, and service company boards haven't really required CEOs to have pay incentives that lead to strategies that create economic value. And so counterintuitively, higher oil prices have actually been negative for most energy stocks, and we think they're going to continue to be 
um, until that changes. Simultaneously, um, the buy side has aligned with us on our call for companies to take the pledge for greater capital discipline, and it's become the default corporate strategy in the sector. So we're actually happy to see that companies have become more disciplined. Um, and the surprise in 2020 could be that if the global economy remains strong, as Evercore ISI envisions, or if we have further escalation of tensions related to the situation with Iran, and oil prices remain strong, the companies are going to actually take the surplus funds and return it to shareholders. And that'd be a good first step in making energy value propositions competitive with that of the rest of S&P 500. So we've underperformed in seven out of the last eight years in energy, but we're making progress. But we need to make progress because the group hasn't been investable for many of these reasons. Doug, I guess it's also worth noting, uh, we talk about crude, but, you know, natural gas prices are way down, so that hasn't necessarily helped some parts of the uh, of the sector. But are there parts of this group that are already adhering to those kind of, uh, kind of capital discipline principles that you're talking about that are actually better positioned? You know, they really, they really have. Um, in 2017, when we started this call, we suggested, um, you know, the companies that return capital to shareholders started to use return on capital employed. At the, at the corporate level um, and to pay CEOs would probably prosper in the market because it would lead to change strategies. And to the surprise of, of many, partially <laughs> including ourselves, the pledgers, uh, Chevron, BP, Shell, ConocoPhillips, et cetera, um, have been 90, 80% of the top 10 performers out of 30 in S&P Energy in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And so while the stock picking outcome has been highly improbable, we're calling for a four-peat in 2020 that the pledgers remain 80% of the top 10 performers in energy in 2020, which I, I realize would be highly improbable, but we think it's going to happen again because we think the buy side will continue to reward the companies that are creating value and returning capital to shareholders, just like in the other 10 sectors of S&P 500. You know, uh, Scott, the U.S. Defense Secretary, Mark Esper, has said that the game has changed. You've had the Ayatollah in Iran uh, calling for revenge and retaliation against the United States and the foreign minister there uh, calling this international terrorism. Given the ratcheting up at least of rhetoric, how are you advising your clients to protect themselves against any threat of potential attack from Iran on their facilities? Well, again, I think that the, the the advice that we're giving is that there's an there's an immediate uptick in the risk to oil facilities in the region, mainly because the Iranians recognize the danger of going after U.S. personnel directly. I think you're going to see Iran be very careful about that, which is why we see uh, we're, we're advising our clients that there is a risk that the Iranians are going to turn back to what they were doing late last up until late last year, which is seizing of oil tankers and and hitting Gulf uh, oil infrastructure. Uh, we think that we think that even sites as significant as Opkeg, which was which, which caught the market really by surprise, uh, are are back on the table again for the Iranians. So we're advising them that despite the deployment of U.S. troops to the region, yeah. we think that's more symbolic and that the risk is going up to those facilities. Gentlemen, we appreciate your time very much this morning and your insights, Scott and Doug. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, we'll have yep, we'll have a lot more on today's sell-off. The markets right now, Dow's down 235. We're watching it closely. Squawk Alley's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Noom is made for the real world. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, Mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, Mix it up. up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, Mix it up. Skip. Mix it up. Run. Mix it, Mix it. I spy with my little eye something beginning with B. Um, bike. Nope. Banana tree. Oh, of course. We must have missed it. Although you might not be able to see it, your small actions can have a real impact with Shell. Drive carbon neutral by filling up and using Shell Go Plus today. Make the change. Drive carbon neutral. Shell. Go well. See goplus.shell.com slash CO2 for details. Oh, a decent drill would make DIY so much easier. Whether you're laying flooring or fitting shelves, 
Head to the B&Q Tool Shop. Get hands-on in store with our wide range of drills, including the Bosch Universal Impact Combi Drill for just £80. The B&Q Tool Shop. You can do it when you're being q it. To LeBron, slam dunk! The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11-2! The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big off-season trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. On the goal line, Gordon scores! It home. Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a move, and a shot, they start! From regular season action to the All-Star game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Search NFL today. Good morning. It is 11 a.m. at the Pentagon and 11 a.m. here on Wall Street. Squawk Alley is live. I am John Ford with Morgan Brennan and Mike Santoli, who's doing all the shows today, live from Post 9 here at the New York Stock Exchange. It's Santoli Friday, which is uh, right. a, a U.S. airstrike killing an Iranian military leader in Baghdad, causing oil prices to spike this morning. Stocks dropping, our Eamon Jabbers has the latest on that from Washington. Eamon? Yeah, good morning, John. We're now getting reaction from Iran and from around the world. In Iran, leaders there the, uh, are saying, the supreme leader is saying, harsh vengeance awaits criminals behind the killing of Qasem Soleimani that was conducted by a U.S. airstrike last night just outside of the Baghdad airport. Meanwhile, in France, President Macron says he's discussed the situation with Russian President Vladimir Putin and also uh, at the State Department here in Washington, John, they're saying that uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has been speaking with a number of world leaders throughout the morning briefing them on the situation, including just recently a statement suggesting that he has been speaking with high-ranking Pakistani military officials. For his part, the President of the United States has offered his explanation for the justification for the attack on Twitter, but also uh, has kept a relatively muted uh, presence on Twitter this morning. As you see his uh, statement there explaining that uh, Qasem, uh, Qasem Soleimani got caught planning additional attacks, and that's why the President felt he needed to take this action last night that he took outside of, ba- or in, outside of the Baghdad International Airport. The president here also returning to business as usual in many ways on Twitter. He's been promoting uh, books that he likes uh, on Twitter. He's been uh, tweeting about impeachment and other topics this morning in addition to his comments on Iran and retweeting a number of people uh, who are in favor of his action in Iran. So the president offering a bit of a muted response, perhaps different than we saw back in October uh, with the strike on al-Baghdadi where the president took a much more visible approach in the hours after that strike. We'll see what happens throughout the rest of the afternoon in terms of the White House response here. But a relatively, I would say, muted response from the President of the United States as the world now awaits an Iranian reaction to this strike last night by U.S. forces. Eamon Javers, thank you for bringing us the latest. The New York Times calls our next guest, quote, one of the most respected and accomplished oil men in the world. Let's bring in Sadad Al Husseini, formerly of Saudi Aramco, who joins us now by phone. Sadad, thanks for being with us this morning. The move we're seeing in crude prices, how sustainable is this? 
Well, good morning, Morgan. I think uh, the current prices are, haven't moved that much. They've moved a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think the markets are pretty well saturated with supply. So we have to wait and see how the situation unfolds. But currently, I, I wouldn't say that we've had a very strong uh, move. It's, it's been a, a fair move, a couple of dollars, $3. Uh, but let's, let's see what happens next. In terms of the potential for what happens next um, and what that could mean in terms of the energy market, IHS market uh, just came out with a note a little while ago, and, and they say that uh, the absence of Soleimani will also risk Iran becoming far less subtle in its actions, raising the risk of a miscalculation leading to an all-out war. How high is the risk that a counter-reaction from Iran now uh, could be on oil fields uh, or other assets uh, related to oil in the region? Uh, I believe the problem is really between the U.S. and Iran at this point. It's not about the oil fields or the other countries in the Gulf. I think uh, Iran has been overplaying its hand. Uh, certainly the attempts to enter the U.S. embassy in Iraq uh, and other uh, attacks on U.S. Uh, military in Iraq. Uh, this is a problem between the U.S. and the Iranians. I don't think that they would want to do anything with the other countries in the region. That that wouldn't advance or affect their, their issue with the U.S. And so I think the focus will be on the U.S. And so, Saad, given that Iran has been working so hard to gain influence in Iraq, and, and given what you just said about... Um, probably the, the, the likelihood that they won't uh, put oil assets at risk. Do you think that they're then unlikely uh, to damage any of Iraq's oil infrastructure in response to this? Yes, uh, I, I doubt very much that they will go after Iraqi installations as well, because at the end of the day, Iraq has been a very close supporter of the Iranian regime. So uh, that would not do them any good. Uh, I believe the situation now is really one of the Iranians needing to confront the reality that their foreign policy is not working. Uh, Soleimani was a problem. He was a, a very extreme element in the Iranian uh, leadership. Uh, there may be others like him, but I think this is the opportunity for the moderates in Iran to try to calm down the events and to try to pull back some of this interference that they're having with other countries. Iraq is their ally. I don't believe that they want to alienate Iraq. Yeah, that's such a key point, especially given the fact that within the country itself, I mean, we've seen this political and social unrest uh, within Iran, thanks to sanctions, thanks to the impact on the economy, protests, de deadly reactions to it. How likely do you think that longer term this could actually lead to more productive negotiations between the U.S. and Iran? Uh, Iran has a very serious uh, economic problem. They have domestic unrest. They have issues with uh, their neighbors. Uh, there's hardly any country in the world that wants to deal with the current re leadership. So uh, if, if they look at their own outlook for the long term, they do need to negotiate. Uh, they do need to uh, climb back down from the confrontational approach they've been taking. If they don't, their situation is just going to get worse domestically. And the Iranian people are already showing that they're not really very happy with this regime. So uh, so in the long term, they have to uh, moderate their, uh, their approach. Uh, whether they will do it now is unlikely because now they feel they have to show some kind of a reaction. Hopefully it will be a very moderate one. So we look at this uh, sharp but fairly contained reaction in the oil markets to today's news. Um, there's some commentary that, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia has spare capacity, could increase production if, uh, in fact, needed. How is that calculus made? Uh, and what price level do you think uh, that supply response might come from? I don't believe there has been a call on Saudi Arabia to do anything, to add any production or any additional capacity. The spare capacity is definitely there. Uh, has been demonstrated um, many times. The, the markets are very steady. Uh, supply is, is more than adequate. The long term, uh, I believe Iran uh, will not have an opportunity to come back into the export uh, markets. Uh, the way they're going, their production will remain domestic. Uh, the same thing applies to other countries. Uh, the recent OPEC meeting certainly underline the need to be very prudent in terms of supply. 
So prices are, are probably going to be quite stable. Supply is going to be quite uh, abundant. By year end 2020, I think there will be a stronger market. But there's no shortage of supply, that's for sure. So, Sadad, do you see economic risk for U.S. interests in the region right now because of this or no? No, absolutely not. Uh, the U.S. interests uh, have not been in Iran or in Iraq. They've been in the, all the other countries uh, that are major producers, major consumers of U.S. exports. And I think the U.S. has shown its hand uh, now that it is not going to tolerate any more uh, interference by the Iranians in uh, the rest of the region. So, if anything, I would say it's probably strengthened the relationships between the U.S. and the other countries. Iran was a foregone conclusion. Uh, Iraq has been so unstable that it wasn't much of a market. And, you know, the same with Syria and others. So, uh, as far as U.S. interests, I think they're very well uh, protected as it stands. Now, Sadat, I know you're an oil guy, but given the fact that energy and security and defense are so uh, interlinked, interconnected, I wonder if you think this is going to increase demand for weapon systems, for defenses, uh, especially if you look at not just these strikes over the last uh, couple of days, but also the attacks we saw on Aramco uh, just a few months ago. I think uh, what we're seeing is that the U.S. has shifted its foreign policy in the region, uh, at least that's how I read it, uh, from one of a passive observer and a continuous kind of warnings to one of a more active, uh, proactive perhaps, uh, player. Uh, this means that the U.S. has far more resources and military capabilities than any of the countries in the region, and it, it won't call on the countries locally to, to uh, probably invest any more than they have done already. It will call on the U.S. to deploy its forces and make them more visible, and hopefully that will deter any further activities, uh, aggressive activities out of regimes like the Iranians or the uh, militias that they have in Iraq. Sadad, finally, I just want to get your thoughts on the actual cost to ship oil and move oil in and out of the region right now, between all of the different activities we've seen over the past year with tanker seizures, uh, now obviously heightened tensions uh, on the heels of, of this strike um, overnight. Is the cost going to continue to rise, and what does that mean in terms of uh, the global dynamics for trade flows of oil? Well, Morgan, I think the delivered cost of oil to the foreign consumers has not significantly changed. The, the uh, oil shipping per barrel is a couple of dollars, say, to the uh, U.S., uh, okay. and the U.S. is importing less oil in any case. So, no, it, I don't think there will be much change in prices. Okay. Sadat al-Husseini, great to get your insights today. Thank you so much for phoning in. Thank you. And still to come, Apple shares crossing the $300 mark for the first time this week. We debate where the stock will go from here next. Stay with us. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers now. Boredom, fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, mix it up. Skip. Mix it up. Run. Mix it up. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. 
With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line. It's intercepted. Listen live as the action unfolds or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. The Kansas- Search NFL today. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. (laughs) But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Apple crossed over the $300 mark for the first time ever this week, hitting a fresh all-time high, uh, closing at a new record. So what comes next for the stock? Tom Forte of DA Davidson and Jeff Cavall of Nomura join us now for that. Guys, good morning. Uh, good morning. Tom, morning, John. Th- this is sort of rare air for Apple in terms of valuation, right? I mean, um, it- it's well over uh, 20 in the in the P.E. territory. Is this a place where we've just got to look for earnings to grow into that throughout 2020? Or is this a premium that you think investors are going to continue to give them because of wearables and services? Sure. So great question, John. The way I think about it is I would agree with your earning into it. And if you look at the story last year, was that Apple was able to perform amazingly well despite a mature smartphone market and despite a relatively speaking weak performing iPhone versus the rest of their portfolio. Well, if you look at 2020 with the emergence of 5G, this could be a multi-year cycle depending on the state of the build out on a global basis. So I think there's a opportunity for Apple to grow into that valuation on the strength of iPhones and 5G this year and next. So, so Jeff, do you agree? Is this a show-me story now, or is it just a love-me story? Uh, You know, I agree with your sense that the multiple is definitely an uncharted territory. The multiple has expanded by four turns just since they launched the iPhone 11 in in September. So that's, uh, that's been a credit to to them executing more crisply, I think, on the 11 than we would have thought. Uh, I think your next question then becomes, okay, well, what's the next leg for the story? And yes, I think most people assume that 5G is it, and I think the multiple has expanded because there's a bit of a clear path into the 5G cycle. Uh, I do differ a little, however, in that I'm not quite as optimistic as others that 5G will be an enormous catalyst for unit sales. We did not see a dramatic increase in unit sales during the 3G to 4G migration. And I would say that there are some similar uh, dynamics in play. The the 5G phones are, as we've seen, more expensive than the 4G equivalents. Uh, And it's not clear to me just yet who is going to assume the burden for that added cost. Tom, um, you know, all of the virtues we can recite about Apple in terms of the long-term durability of a lot of its franchises, the push into services, it's, you know, the position of its ecosystem were almost equally true a year ago. I mean, perhaps there was a little bit less clarity on some of those aspects, but clearly this stock traded at $142 a year ago today, closed there as a matter of fact, and most of that was also true. So I, I wonder where we are in this kind of reevaluation, this massive perception shift in terms of your clients, how much they feel they need to own, how confident they are in the very long-term picture that these are very durable cash flows that are being produced. Obviously, we're all on alert for that moment when people get overexcited about Apple, as it happened in 2012, where it created a significant top in the stock, but not a long, not a not a perpetual uh, top in the stock. Obviously, you yep, know some great points there, Mike. The way that I think about it is, the story in 2019 was Apple's ability to show investors that they can diversify their revenue stream away from smartphones and away from iPhone. And you look at that in their efforts in financial services, both on the payment front with Apple Pay and on the credit card front with Apple Card. Uh, You're starting to see signs on healthcare and other areas. So I think to the extent that they showed us last year that they're able to grow that business, which I believe grew in the high teens uh, X to iPhone, and then to the extent you can layer on a rebound in iPhone sales, 
I think that could result in further upside in shares from here. Jeffrey, what would it take to change your stance on this stock? I mean, given the fact that you're neutral, your price target is 225, um, what do you mm. see as, I guess, the upside risk to your rating? Well, Upside risk to the rating. That wasn't a question I was expecting, Morgan, but uh, I would put it this way. Uh, I think that Apple has done a number of things much better than we would have expected uh, starting 2019. And we talked about the iPhone 11 bit a moment ago. Uh, I, I, I guess I would say the services growth trajectory is plus or minus what we'd expected. The wearables business, though, is much stronger than we thought. That's partly on the watch and partly on on the AirPod, mostly on the AirPod primarily. So uh, I think that Apple has, in fact, made a number of uh, steps forward in 2019 that we were not looking for at the beginning of, of the year. Uh, I am not certain, however, that they will be able to recreate that success in 2020, and that's why we've, we've been on the, on the sidelines and look to remain so for, for the year. All right. Yeah, that's a risky call, as I'm sure you can feel at this level. Tom, finally, uh, wearables yes. or 5G? <laughs> what's what's the stock going to really respond to this year? And I mean, because 5G, we're not going to know whether that's a big winner for them until well into the back end of the year. Yep. So I would argue 5G, given the potential. Uh, to really change connectivity, change use cases for mobile devices. So I agree with you that it's a late 2020 story, but I think 5G is really what could uh, push the stock much farther forward. All right, we'll see. Yeah, Tom, and then, Jeffrey, then that, that's, that's where I disagree. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, up next, the implications for defense stocks as a new conflict in the Middle East develops. We break down today's biggest movers after the break, and there are some big ones. Stay with us. My mom always told me. Boredom, fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap notify me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. To LeBron, slam dunk. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big offseason trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got... and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... Democrats... You can use your stop-and-go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. I already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home the wide world of college sports. Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! Hand off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges. Touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Along the goal line, Gordon scores! And takes it home! 
Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he's... Live on TuneIn Premium. season action to the all-star game and through the stanley cup in june hear the home and away call for every game for every team live at home or on the go never miss a game with the nhl on tune in premium upgrade today Welcome back to Squawk Alley. Tesla releasing its Q4 delivery number numbers this morning. And Phil LeBeau is live in Chicago with those details for us. Phil. Morgan, these numbers are better than many expected. Most were expecting deliveries of about 104, 105,000 for the fourth quarter. But when you look at Tesla's deliveries, yeah, the bulk of them were Model 3 and a lot more Model 3 than people were expecting. The total coming in at 112,000. So for the full year of 2019, Tesla did meet its minimum guidance of 360,000 vehicles being delivered. The total coming in at 367,000 uh, vehicles delivered in 2019. We'll get the 2020 guidance when the company reports earnings uh, over the next four or five weeks. In terms of how much impact China played in 2019, very little. But they have opened that plant. They have built about 1,000 vehicles, what they call sal saleable vehicles, those deliveries, those public deliveries, they've already delivered some to some Tesla employees there, but those public deliveries, those are going to start in China next week. So as you take a look at shares of Tesla, the stock getting a little bit of a move higher today uh, on the news that it did exceed expectations. But really, what's pushed this stock higher, Mike, has been the expectation that China along with the Model Y and the margin potential, the, the ability to grow margins with the Model Y, that's what's pushing the stock higher, in addition to analysts pushing up their price targets. No big, no doubt, Phil. Uh, this one moves on the next big thing, uh, and that is China right now. We will watch. Thank you. Uh, European markets set to close in just a moment. Dom Chu has a breakdown of today's action overseas. Hi, Dom. All right, so Mike, we've got European stocks slipping from their record high levels on the back of that U.S. airstrike killing Iran's top military commander. As you can see here, more red than green. But the stock 600 is still closing off the lows of the session after being down as much as a percent or so earlier on in the day. You know, European energy companies very much in focus today, just like their American counterparts. Check out shares of oil majors like British Petroleum, BP, also Royal Dutch Shell, Equinor as well, all up between 1% and 2% there. A different story, though, for European air Airlines, oil's rally is weighing on shares of those companies. EasyJet down 4% today. Lufthansa and Air France both down more than 6% on the day's action. Lufthansa is set to post its worst day of trading since June of last year. And remember, this is an industry that was already facing pressure from gloomy passenger forecasts heading into the new year as well. Putting the moves today in context a little bit more, though, the price of Brent crude, the global benchmark there, trading at around $60 per barrel. That's still roughly 8% below the peak of 75 Five bucks a barrel that we saw back in April. We'll continue to watch that oil trade throughout the course of the day and the reaction from European leaders. France's President Emmanuel Macron so far urging Iran to refrain from any provocation in talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Guys, I will now send things back over to you, John. All right. Thank you, Dom. And it is time for a news update. Sue Herrera has it at HQ. Sue. Indeed, I do. Thank you, John. Here's what's happening at this hour, everyone. Hezbollah officials gathered at the Iranian embassy in Beirut to offer condolences following a U.S. strike that killed Iran's top military general. Qasem Soleimani led all of the Revolutionary Guard's expeditionary forces in the Middle East. Hamas condemning the killing of Soleimani, saying that he had a prominent role in supporting the Palestinian resistance. A Hamas spokesman said the crime reflects the American recklessness in the region and its violation of state sovereignty. Elsewhere, one of the largest evacuations in Australia's history is underway ahead of hot weather and strong winds that are forecast to worsen the devastating wildfires across that country. More than 200 fires are burning and warnings of extreme danger to come Saturday prompted the mass evacuations. And a much-coveted Christmas present, take a look at that, lands a Georgia boy in the hospital after he accidentally swallowed an AirPod. You can see that x-ray shows the device inside the seven-year-old. Doctors assuring his mom, though, that it will be fine after the device, shall we say, makes its way through. 
Seven years old with an AirPod. I don't know. Might be a little too young. That's the news update this hour. Back downtown to you guys. Morgan? Well, we're glad that he will make a recovery from yes. that. Sue, yes. Sue Herrera, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oil surging and stocks falling following the U.S. strike that killed Iran's top military commander in Baghdad. Take a look at major averages. We're off lows of the session, but still well into the red. Worst day for the major averages uh, in just about a month with the Dow down 239. The S&P also down about seven tenths of a percent. Similar move lower for the Nasdaq as well. We're back after a quick break. This is not a cat. This is not a rocket. And this is not a sail. That's right. At Smarty Mobile, we're not having a sale. While others are slashing prices, we're introducing our best ever new plans. Take our new 30 gig data SIM for just £10 a month. With unlimited calls and texts and no speed restrictions, credit checks or contract tying you down, why shop around? New plans, great value. Now that's Smarty. Grab yours today. Search Smarty Mobile. See smarty.co.uk for terms. The Honda Jazz, the car that feels fabulously small on the outside, yet deceptively big on the inside, with its incredible storage solutions and magic folding seats, not to mention the suite of advanced safety features. And now with the small but big Jazz event, it's available with 0% APR representative and five years complimentary servicing until January 31st. Visit your local dealer to find out more. Honda dealers are credit brokers, not lenders. Finance provided by Honda Finance Europe, authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Terms and conditions apply. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. <laughs> but we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got... and Fox News Talk... The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Oil prices surging after a U.S. military strike killed a top Iranian commander overnight. Questions over potential retaliation putting pressure on the global oil supply, at least perceptions of it. Our global markets reporter Seema Modi has more on that. Hi, Seema. Hi, Mike. Iran's supreme leader this morning, Ayatollah Khamenei, vowing to hit back, saying, quote, harsh retaliation is waiting. Now, the rise in oil prices that we're seeing this hour reflects this concern among investors that Iran's response to the U.S. airstrike could possibly disrupt the transportation or production of oil, either through the Strait of Hormuz, a critical gateway to the world's oil industry, managing 20 percent of global supply, which would be a particular challenge for the dozens of countries that import Middle Eastern crude in large quantities, analysts pointing to India, Turkey, and China. Another way experts say Iran could retaliate is by taking aim at Iraq, the fifth largest producer of oil. Iran has, of course, been building its presence on the ground over the past few weeks, and analysts at Eurasia say oil prices could run up to $80 if the conflict spreads to the oil, feeds, oil fields of southern Iraq, or if Iranian harassment of commercial shipping intensifies. Either way, most people say Iraq will quickly become a battleground as U.S. and Iran tensions rise. Council on Foreign Relations Stephen Cook, though, says that the confrontation with Iran could result in a number of options that go beyond energy. Attacks on Syria, stepping up violence in Afghanistan, Hezbollah strikes in Israel, all of which could increase the risk of instability across the Middle East. And that's partly why we're seeing the safe haven trade today, the Japanese yen and gold prices trading higher at this hour. Mike, back to you. Absolutely seem a lot to consider there. Thank you. For more, let's bring in Paul Sankey of Mizuho, who joins us now on the phone, as well as CMC contributor Scott Nations 
who is in uh, Chicago. Paul, uh, good morning. How, how do we put this move in crude oil into the longer term context? Obviously, adding back some some perhaps geopolitical risk premium into the price, but is it going to be sustainable? Well, as you know, uh, Iraq is producing a lot of oil, and um, <laughs> you know exactly where that goes is is, is going to be a key point. <laughs> Iraq is uh, really almost well; it's the fifth biggest oil producer in the world right now, and um, you know I, I think that significant unrest, uh, which is obviously potential, is is going to be a major issue and. Additionally, as you know, Iran and Iraq combine to be the base, essentially the, the fourth biggest producer in the world. So you have U.S., you have Russia, you have Saudi, and then if you think about the Shia, you've got uh, a massive producer here with a major uh, geopolitical event. Uh Scott, uh, this comes at a time when crude oil was already uh, kind of bumping up against the uh, top end of its range. How do you see the trading dynamics right now? I mean, obviously you have, you know, kind of the, the supply-demand picture, which has mostly been about ample supply, and then you have the trading dynamics. Uh, the trading dynamic, Mike, is I think what is interesting, and why is that? It's because crude oil has actually come back quite a bit since news got out. The high for the Feb contract was about $64 even. You know, we spent a fair amount of time this morning at 63.40 in that contract, which was up quite a bit, up 3.6%. But, you know, that is also the high that we saw in September after the drone attack against Aramco. So once the market saw that we were not going to spend some substantial time above 63.40, it came back and it's continued to come back. So as far as the dynamic, I don't really think anybody should be hurt. Why? Because even at this level of about $63, we're still in the middle of the 52-week range. And then if you broaden out a little bit, we are still in the middle of the, lar of the larger uh, two-year range. So uh, the, add the fact that Russia has plenty of additional capacity. In fact, Russia has been chafing at the limits imposed by OPEC+. Plus. They want to produce and sell more crude oil and particularly more distillates. We also know that the Saudis have additional capacity that they're not using, and that's going to be good for oil prices, or it's going to keep volatility low. And in addition, let's remember that Aramco got back online by the end of November from the middle of September strikes. So there's plenty of supply. I would be surprised if we saw a really extraordinary volatility. We're going to see plenty of volatility, but there's no reason to think that it's going to, to just be a shock. Paul, let's talk stocks for a minute. Heaven forbid we see an escalation in terms of these tensions, in terms of this conflict, and maybe you do see some of that energy infrastructure in embroiled in that. Which are the companies, which are the integrated oil majors that have the most exposure, exposure to the region and could be affected the most? Well, um, Oxy, uh, Exxon are both exposed, but I think the big point is that the difference between $50 and $60 is enormous free cash flow. And um, so we want to own these oils going into 2020. There's no question about that. You want to own the oils pretty much across the board. I mean, it's interesting because, of course, the sector is down slightly. You have a lot of refiners in there that are not well positioned for this type of a move. But the uh, exploration and production companies uh, are up. So at this point, would you uh, essentially bake in these price levels to your expectations yeah, I mean, I love, for what the cash flows can the be for the year? I, I absolutely love the permian players here. EOG, PXD, um, Fang, you know, these are really good companies now. And, um, you know, this just, it's just a reminder that we want to own U.S. oil, you know, and that's it, basically. Scott, we had Sassad al-Husseini on earlier saying that he didn't think that uh, U.S. interests in the region had been harmed uh, by this action, or really threatened very much. Uh, do you think the price of oil over the near to medium term is gonna eventually reflect that? Uh, or, or do you think that's just one man's opinion? It, it, we, we have to see what happens over the next week. As far as crude oil prices, I'll point out that uh, Saudi Aramco was attacked on September 14th. Our market opened at the uh, end of the weekend on September 16th, and then by the end of September, crude oil prices had given back all of the gain and were back where they were. So when it comes to purely economic point of view, 
I don't think that our interests have been substantially harmed. Geopolitically, we're going to have to see. But as far as crude oil prices and supply, what it's going to mean for consumers of crude oil, I don't think our, our geoeconomic issue, uh, I don't think it's going to be a big geoeconomic issue for the United States. All right, Scott, we can certainly hope for that. Um, Scott and Paul, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, and Scott. when we come back, geopolitical risk rattling the broader markets in today's session. But what's the verdict for tech? We will break it down with two of the street's top strategists next. Stay with us. Whether you've enjoyed the legendary terrain in Telluride, take the helm and ignite your spirit of adventure with a sunsail holiday. Relax on a skippered yacht from sunny St. Lucia to the nutmeg-scented shores of Grenada. Or take charge with a bareboat charter along Dubrovnik's glittering coastline. With up to 20% off selected destinations, now is the time to book your sunsail adventure. Sunsail. See the world differently. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it, run, skin, mix it, run, mix it, mix it. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night. And somehow I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> it was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here. Testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Which tests harder so you can buy smarter? Visit which.co.uk. Hello, I'm here at the Race for Life 5K, joined by Jackie Clark. Jackie, what would first place today mean to you? Uh, I think you've got the wrong race, love. This is Race for Life. This is about beating cancer, not getting a gold medal. And how did you train for this event? I just turned up. It's a walk in the park, literally. Why aren't you doing it? Uh... Uh, Trainers on, let's go. We're not athletes, we're cancer beaters. Sign up to Race for Life now and get 30% off entry until the 31st of January in partnership with Tesco. The NASDAQ is still above 9,000 as today's stock sell-off continues. Frank Holland has more on today's biggest movers. Frank? Hey there, John. You know, just above 9,000 right now. The NASDAQ coming off a fresh record high on the first trading day of 2020, now falling more than a half a percent and in the red on that Iraq strike news. Today, Tesla is the biggest gainer in the NASDAQ 100, up right around 4% after beating delivery estimates, also benefiting from concerns about higher fuel prices. CEO Elon Musk has repeatedly said cheap oil is bad for the electric car maker. Energy and consumer names also moving higher. XL, a large natural gas provider in the middle of the country, and utility Exelon moving higher, along with Charter Communications, that's a large cable provider, and Chinese B2C e-commerce site JD.com. All the FANG names today in the red. Amazon down more than a percent, facing a few negative headlines that it allegedly threatens to fire climate change activists. But airline stocks, they're the hardest hit today, really on those fuel concerns. American falling more than 3%. The company actually warned last year about the impact of fuel cost on margins. CEO Doug Parker said oil is the company's second largest expense. Low-cost provider Allegiant, JetBlue, and United all falling a percent and a half or more, again, on those fuel cost concerns. Back over to you. All right, Frank, thank you. So does today's market drop offer some buying opportunities in tech? Joining us now with their best picks for 2020 and maybe some names to stay away from, Steve Milanovic of Wolf Research and Gene Munster of Loop Ventures. Uh, guys, good morning. Steve, uh, you've put out uh, a report talking about an investor survey and also giving some of your own calls. You, you don't think investors should be looking for deals and names like Pinterest, Wayfair, TripAdvisor, Grubhub, Slack. Why not? Well, I think tech may be due for a correction. So, look, love technology longer term, but things have gotten a little bit frothy here, I think. Um, 
you've had mostly PE expansion driving a 42% increase in tech stocks over the last 12 months. So we're now at a point where the economy is continuing to be weak. We got more ISM numbers out today that were fairly poor. Tech earnings are actually down year over year. That's all very normal. What's not normal is the PE is up at about 21 times and is not corrected the way you typically see in a late cycle. So as a result, we'd be a little bit careful. Uh, from a strategy perspective, we're underweight semis and hardware. We're overweight services and internet. We also today put out a list of 30 longs and shorts, which is a screen we do. It's momentum-based, so it actually has a lot of semi names on the long side, a little bit more concerned about internet and some of the legacy names. So we'd just be a little bit careful coming into the new year. So if you're trying to be strategic, Gene, how do you separate the wheat from the chaff in tech this year? Well, I think you go back to what would be undeniable truths. I know, John, you've talked about the big trends for the next decade, and I think if you really anchor your investments in what are those undeniable truths, that if you, I think it frees you up a little bit not to be as concerned about where some of the current trading ranges are. And those truths, I think there are four of them, wearables, 5G, electrification of vehicles, and autonomy. And I think uh, if you would agree that those trends are a function of time before it has a significantly larger impact on our lives, then the, the two easiest plays are Apple and, uh, and Tesla. And very different stories, different cultures between the businesses. Uh, but I think that uh, despite the moves in both of those stocks, I think that there is still significant upside to those. I would also agree with Steve that some of these smaller companies um, and some companies that uh, have, I think, what would be a more competitive environment not rooted in an undeniable truth. For example, Netflix, uh, streaming to me is not an undeniable truth. Social media is not an undeniable truth. Uh, those are the stories that I'd be more concerned about. Jane, I want to go back to Tesla for a minute. The fact that the stock is trading just below 450 a share right now, another high uh, today. And of course, we got those delivery numbers as well. When you talk about upside in that name, how much higher can it actually go? So uh, it's an $81 billion market cap today. And uh, I, the reason why I even hesitate to answer the question is you don't have uh, hard gap earnings and EPS to really root yourself into. So the exercise is really about what should a transformative company be valued at. And I think it's uh, much higher than $80 billion. For example, Netflix, which I think is overvalued, but let's, Netflix is currently $145 billion. And I think that's something that's having as profound of an impact as uh, electrification and autonomy, which Tesla is doing, should be uh, at a base case at a $150 billion company. So uh, kind of putting that together, I think you can kind of build a case for a, a $900 stock here. Um, and I think it's going to take, I just want to be clear too, this is a, a good day for Tesla. It is not the day. This is not the day where the company has escape velocity, where we can mark it as a, a successful company forever. They still got to get the Model Y out. Elon still needs to be uh, behaved. Uh, they still need to get China uh, more production out of that. Germany, there's still a lot of moving parts. But I think when I think about the upside to the, the market cap of Tesla, over the next three quarters are really going to be a telling piece. And if they deliver on that, I think you could see some measurable movement higher in the stock. Yeah, a lot of good news out of them lately, though. Uh, Steve, I, I wonder, you, you talked about this uh, report and this the screen that you put uh, for stocks based on momentum. Does momentum... something different coming into a year like this when you had such dramatic moves higher in 2019? I mean, just because something's been moving higher, shouldn't that mean something uh, a little different in 2020? It could. You know, we like to say that in tech, momentum matters 80% of the time. And valuation really only matters when you're at an extreme. I think we could argue that we're at an extreme. So having lived through 2008 and then 2000, you know, you're seeing the total U.S. market cap, uh, 150 of GDP, uh, AMD at 33 times earnings, um, Apple, you know, which is a fantastic company, but I was looking the other day and Apple's uh, 2020 consensus number today is lower than a year ago, yet the stock has doubled. So I think we are getting into that turf where it's not just about momentum. The thing is, we still got the central banks printing money. And frankly, in the short term, that tends to help the stocks. The long term, it creates malinvestment, like we saw in perhaps WeWork and Uber and some other question marks. So, you know, we still want to be in tech over time to be sure, but I think momentum might mean something a little bit different this year. Yeah, when I think of momentum, sometimes I think about Wiley e. Coyote. Um, Steve, Gene, thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Still to come. Airlines getting slammed as oil prices surge and geopolitical risks rise. Delta, Southwest American, and United all falling in today's session and taking the broader Dow Transports average down 1.2% in trading. A lot more Squawk Alley still ahead. Stay with us. So what are you working on? Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? To LeBron, slam dunk! The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big offseason trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Welcome back to Squawk Alley. Defense stocks bucking the downtrend today in the broader market, soaring following the U.S. airstrike that killed a top Iranian military commander overnight in Baghdad. New 52-week highs for Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics are higher as well. Also, military drone makers like Aerovironment and Kratos, some of the big movers today. IT services contractors with cyber capabilities like Lidos and Booz Allen Hamilton also in the green. But as with crude and the price jump in that market today, the question is, can the gains actually be sustained? Well, Roman Schweitzer of Cowan joins us now with the implications for the U.S. defense picture. Roman, great to see you today. Thanks, Morgan. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So you put out a note uh, on this strike and the implications this morning. Break that down for us. Sure. Well, I, I mean, first off, I think it's important to note that this is really uh, unprecedented. I mean, clearly there was a level given at the, as a, at the presidential level. This was probably not the number one uh, recommendation on that list of things to do. Uh, and I think that uh, the uh, recent uh, attacks and demonstrations near the U.S. Embassy uh, sort of brought those uh, shutters of Benghazi, and certainly nothing like that was going to uh, happen on this president's watch, or uh, as certainly his belief. Uh, and so as we look forward into the year, uh, you know, I know there's been a, a lot of people uh, giving their opinions and things like that. I, I don't necessarily agree that the Iranian response is going to be wide or something as drastic as closing the straits. I think it'll be something targeted at U.S. interests specifically, um, perhaps uh, getting the U.S. ejected from Iraq. Um, perhaps striking other U.S. interests globally, uh, or we do have a president that has personal financial interests that are global uh, and perhaps not as uh, hard target protected as some other uh, areas within the U.S. or externally. Uh, I don't believe the Iranians would uh, attack the U.S. mainland because that would certainly bring retaliatory strikes. 
Uh, regionally, though, I think it's important to note that DOD has been trying to essentially get out of the Middle East or reposition and reposture uh, towards Asia and Europe. Uh, this certainly complicates that um, from a policy perspective, uh, planning perspective, and also from a budgetary perspective. Uh, we had been anticipating a, a decline in overseas contingency operations spending, but I would imagine that the Defense Department will uh, submit a, uh, in a supplemental request for spending in fiscal 20 for enhanced Middle East presence, and that presence could uh, stay for, for a greater part of a year. I don't think there's a timetable on the Iranian response. Yeah, and that, that budget piece of this is, is certainly, I think, key for some of the moves we're seeing in the stocks uh, today as well. Given the fact that we're expecting that fiscal 2021 budget request, defense budget request uh, from the administration as soon as next month, and there had been this expectation that we're going to see this perhaps even flatlining in terms of top-line growth, do you think this changes the narrative? Uh, I do, I do. Um, you know, certainly um, the, the budget is kind of baked in terms of this fiscal year. Uh, Congress uh, has appropriated the president to sign those bills. So um, the, the trajectory, at least short term, is kind of baked in. Uh, I think there will be uh, an elevated request uh, for fiscal 21. Uh, and that does sort of bump out that uh, sort of flattish to possibly even down uh, scenario uh, a year or perhaps even two. Um, and really, it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting uh, balance between how DOD prepares for this sort of more challenging peer threat uh, that's proposed by China and Russia back to sort of the, uh, the, the uh, Middle East uh, contingency operation kind of threat we've faced for the last 20 years. Foreign military sales have, have been growing. Uh, the, the notifications for foreign military sales last year were up, I think, 38 percent year on year to almost $68 billion. Uh, a lot of that has helped fuel the contractors, and actually a lot of that demand has come from the Middle East as well. Would you expect to continue to see more of these types of sales happening to our allies in the region, especially given the fact that these tensions are continuing to increase? Well, look, I mean, certainly there is steady uh, demand from countries in the GCC. Um, Saudi Arabia has, uh, of course, been in the penalty box, and Congress has not been uh, willing to entertain uh, additional sales uh, to Saudi, certainly in the offensive category. Uh, I, I really think the response here by the Iranians will, uh, will be a huge uh, factor uh, in, in what those countries do. Uh, you know, clearly uh, the U.S. Uh, stepping up and taking this action in such an overt way uh, really does uh, re recalibrate, recalibrate a lot of the calculations uh, in, in the in the region this morning and today, and yeah. uh, you know really a, a next move is for the is for the Roman, Iranians. What about the threat uh, of cyber attacks or the role of cyber attacks as retaliation? Are those not visible enough, or do you think that's on the table? Uh, no, I, absolutely. I, I think that's a that's a great point. Uh, and that is a way to go after uh, specific U.S. interests, um, both, uh, both military and commercial. Uh, Iran has uh, demonstrated a, a capability and wherewithal to do that. Uh, and, and again, but to your point, uh, is that high profile enough? Uh, I mean, obviously taking a tier one um, personality off the street like this, uh, a guy who um, you know kind of uh, flies around the Middle East with impunity, uh, it is a lot different than uh, you know hacking a bank uh, or OPM or something like that. So um, you know, again, I, th I think I think actually the Iranians will be pretty measured uh, and, and targeted in their response, um, but I would imagine cyber will be a piece of that. Roman, great to get your thoughts. Thank you for joining us today. Squawk Alley is back in less than three minutes. We set out to make the... Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, mix it up. Skip. Mix it up. Run. Mix it, mix it. 
Smart Sports Wagering Talk is now on TuneIn. This is Brett Musburger. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Search B-E-T-R. Be better informed. Be better prepared. And remember, cash and tickets is what it's all about. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest additions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. And as we head toward noon, uh, major indices still in the red, but they've been trying to battle back for much of this hour. In tech, I'll point out enterprise names are uh, doing the worst. Hewlett-Packard, NetApp. Zendesk all down more than 2%. Obviously finished at a high momentum point yesterday at an all-time high. Arguably, the market was looking for a little excuse to back off. Really a pretty measured, uh, resilient response. So giving back a little more than half of yesterday's gain so far. Crude higher, gold higher, defense stocks higher, uh, bucking the trend given everything we're seeing in terms of geopolitical context right now. With that, happy weekend. Let's get to Scott in the half. All right, John, thanks so much. I'm Scott Walker, front and center this hour. Your money and the markets, what the sudden escalation in the Middle East means for all of it. Stocks remain lower after a U.S. airstrike kills the top military commander in Iran. Oil spiking, airlines are lower, perhaps not surprising on any front. The investment committee is here with me as well. Joe Terranova, John Najeri, and Josh Brown. Megan Shu is the senior investment strategist at the Wilmington Trust. It's good to have you all uh, with us. Uh, Joe, you get the first crack. Uh, do what you guys do best, and that is sort of look at the markets. You take these kinds of events into account and try to advise people on how to view it. Yeah, uh, I think the right strategy right now, less is more. I don't think you want to be aggressively making adjustments to your portfolio. Myself, personally, I looked at my energy exposure. I see that I have Hess, which has a high correlation to the price of oil moving higher. I also have One Oak. I've suggested in the last couple of days exposure to refiners. If the price of oil is going to move higher, I'm wrong in that suggestion. What I have done is I've added Suncor. Why did I do that? Because if there is a need to tap production outside the Middle East or the U.S., we look up north, the Canadians have that. It's a Canadian oil play. The Chinese can access that as well. So I think that's the right strategy. I sold out of Capital One. Why? I don't like uh, where we're sitting right now in terms of yield. And the ISM manufacturing, that was not a good number. So too much exposure to financials. Gave up Capital One. I took that cash, put right. it into Suncor. Um, but less is more. Let's focus on the the impact, Doc, of, of what we had uh, overnight in the Middle East. Um, 
Joe buys Suncor as a direct relation to that, uh, an energy play. You bought some Halliburton calls today. I did. For the same reason? Yeah, there was uh, aggressive buying in Halliburton, and so we were just following, coattailing, uh, if you will, Judge, the smart money in there. Um, uh, yesterday we had XLE as an unusual activity. St that particular ETF, that's the subsector of the S&P 500, focused on energy, was up 1.5% in the pre. It's flat right now. Um, so this tells you an awful lot, as well as the market comeback, Judge. Not all the way back, but the market comeback from a 50-point S&P sell-off to, you know, we were hovering right there around 20 an hour ago uh, as far as the downside of the market. Uh, it harkens back to that September 14th, 15th, 16th when the Saudi facilities were hit, again, by Iran. Um, there was not a response to that, but there was a response in the energy markets, dramatic response, 20% pop in crude, and then it was 10% just three days later, and then it was gone two weeks later. So uh, I'm just putting this into context versus that, saying I'm not buying Halliburton because I think, oh my gosh, you know, this means everything's great for energy. I just think that particular one, pulling energy and servicing energy like Schlumberger, for instance, I think those will do well. Domestic energy stocks that Pete's talked about, um, Conoco, uh, Marathon, and the like, you know, there's a whole host of these, Chesapeake, these, these all of these are doing right well. Now. I'm sorry to, to mm -hmm. jump on you there. Whether Halliburton or Schlumberger, which Josh, you bought um, in, in December or you bought it earlier this week. Um, really tells a story. Here you have a day where oil is kind of everything in the focus of the conversation. Yep. You have what was, you know, give your definition of a spike. I mean, in prior years, you might have had a much larger move. Yep. Now some of that's fading. These stocks, Josh, can't get a boost almost no matter what. Yeah. And, so, and this is a representation of that today, if you look at the charts. Sure. So one thing the market loves to do, it's remove money from the pockets of people who overreact to headlines. If you came in this morning and you saw futures prior to the open, you would have thought today would have been a huge day for oil and gold and a very negative day for the market. In the meanwhile, the VIX, uh, I think the high print of the day was 16. We're back at 13.3. Stocks are incredibly resilient. Large cap tech got bought from the open, still hasn't stopped. We'll see where they close. If they get them green, I won't fall out of my chair. Um, in the meanwhile, no areas of the market are really getting hammered. You only have 10 stocks in the S&P 500 that are down more than 3% on the day. And as you mentioned, that big oil pop and oil stock pop has already faded. So I think when you see these geopolitical events, you see these, these headline scares, Oftentimes, the correct thing to do is not to jump on the bandwagon because we see how quickly that kind of thing gets faded. Now, turning to the question of the oil stocks themselves, there is a very good reason these stocks can't catch a bid, even on a day like today. And that is the U.S. energy company complex has $200 billion worth of debt that they must repay in the next four years. $40 billion of that debt comes due in calendar 2020. They can't raise money in secondaries without crushing their stock price. They can't do many debt deals. That market is closed to shale producers. That's why the rallies in these names fade so quickly, because people can't wait to get out. I did buy SLB. I think it's very distinct. They are doing the opposite of shale. They're focused away from shale. They took a $12 billion write-down to get out of that stuff. They're focused on international energy, technology on the oil field itself, and they are not uh, heavily involved in drilling the Permian Basin and some of the areas that, that are producing a glut. So I like Halliburton. I like SLB. Technically, they both have the same chart. I think they look great. Um, I think it was Goldman. Somebody came out recently with a target of uh, 50, 56 bucks on uh, on Schlumberger. You got a 5% dividend yield while you wait. If that's even half right, could be a total return in, in uh, the high teens, low 20% range. So I'm, I'm in the name, but I'm not going nuts on oil producers. I don't think we're out of the woods. I agree with Joe and John. Not a great you know scenario. If you're looking at names like Exxon and Chevron today, you're like, what gives? If, if these stocks can't get a bump, on a day where crude is the headline of uh, most shows on CNBC, when the heck? Can By the way, if this happened in 2005, Joe would agree. 
um, oil would be up like 15. Yes, my point. Oh, at the outset, and these stocks, these stocks would different be going time. bananas. It's right, like a very different narrative. And or because of that changed. September when we saw, you know, again, 14th, 15th, 16th, when we saw that massive pop right. on the Saudi facility. Had we not seen that, Judge, this would be a 10% pop today. And would it hold? Eh, you know, we'll have to see what the Iranian response, when the Iranian response. No, the difference is. was 10, 10 years ago, the U.S. was producing 5 million barrels of oil a day. Yes. Now it's 12. There's nothing more that needs to be said, and that is why you're not getting that kind of outsized reaction that we all grew up with. Just real quick, I keep talking about high-yield energy debt, and Josh brings up an excellent point. There's a significant amount of maturity. This is good. An oil price around 60 to 65 is good for a lot of these shale players' ability to actually roll the maturities forward. So I like that. I think that is one of the reasons why you're seeing high yield um, and investment grade moving higher today. This is also good for the Russians and the Brazilians. So that lends itself again back to the emerging market. And, and I think the U.S. is an important part of that. There's also a significant amount of spare capacity in Saudi Arabia, in Russia, in other elements within OPEC. So I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing a more tempered response. And then the ISM that Joe mentioned earlier, on the demand side, that picture is still choppy. We're still kind of in that bottoming process. So from the supply and demand side, you both have some of these headwinds to oil and energy stocks that are tempering the response from this geopolitical rest. So beyond the oil complex, uh, not surprisingly at all, defense-related names are on the rise today. In fact, let's bring in our Jim Labenthal. We always like to talk to one of our own when they do make a move, and Jim Labenthal's done uh, just that today. Jimmy, are you there? Yes, I'm with you, Scott. You added to one of your positions today. Which one? It's north of Drummond, and it's one. <clears throat> excuse me, as I clear my throat. It's one that I've uh, mentioned on the show quite a bit in the last few weeks. First, with the announcement of the uh, Space Force, uh, but now I've got it uh, because it's clear that we are escalating in the Middle East, uh, and military hostilities in the 21st century are not going to be Marines landing on the shores of Tehran. It's not going to be uh, submarines taking out uh, uh, military vessels. It's going to be missiles. It's going to be drones. It's going to be satellite surveillance. Uh, these are all the sorts of things that Northrop Grumman specializes in. Uh, you look at the valuation at about 16 times this year's earnings, and that's very compelling on its own. You look at the chart, and you realize this thing's kind of been stuck for the last two years. So as a value investor, this is the sort of thing you love. It's a, it's a wonderfully priced stock with a uh, unfortunate but significant catalyst. And I just want to close by saying, look, I, I'm not a war monger. I, I, I don't wake up every day hoping for bullets and missiles to fly. But it's very clear that they are flying, and they're going to continue to fly. It's unlikely uh, that yesterday's strike is going to be uh, uh, unresponded to. Had some experts on the air, in fact, making that point that this is a game changer, Jim, in the region and stocks like this and others you would expect to continue to keep working? Uh, I would. You know, another name in this space is Lockheed Martin. Uh, again, very mm -hmm. heavy in satellite missiles. Uh, also take a look at Raytheon, although they're diluting their, um, their aerospace and defense technology with the United Technologies acquisition. Frankly, I think the best of the bunch is Northrop Grumman. And again, I would stay away. I know it sounds crazy as an ex-naval guy, but I'd stay away from Huntington in Ingalls. Uh, it's not ships that we need right now. It's uh, missiles, satellites, and the like. And I, I say that without any joy. Hey, Jim, it's Josh Brown. So Lockheed Martin's been in an uptrend um, pretty much since October. Today, it's obviously having a big move up uh, 16 bucks a share. Uh, another all-time high, made an all-time high yesterday before anything even happened. Um, but if you buy a stock like this today, or Raytheon, or, or any of them, frankly, um, are, are you kind of like buying right at the point of maximum enthusiasm and then a couple of days go by, nothing happens, and they fade, and maybe you had a better opportunity if you didn't jump in? Or do you think there's enough power here to what's going on in the secular trend that it's worth buying on, on price spikes like today? I think you make a very great point. Uh, there could be a little bit of fading, and frankly, in Lockheed Martin, that, that's certainly the case. The stock's been a home run, and I keep finding myself being chased out of it by the accelerating price. But with Northrop Grumman, if you look at the chart, um, you know, it really hasn't gone anywhere over two years. It's gone up and down, but really hasn't gone anywhere. With the attractive valuation, I feel comfortable buying Eve Josh on a day that it's up 5%. 
That said, I still have some dry powder. I'll see what next week brings. I have more dry powder that I can deploy into this name, but I'm comfortable buying it today. Jimmy, we appreciate you calling in, sharing this wisdom with our viewers. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you on the other side. That's you our, too. Uh, Thank Jim you, Lee gentlemen. Nicole. You bet. Um, the other area I wanted to hit is uh, airlines. Um, again, if you're worried about you know crude having a prolonged move, and look, I've seen some forecasts this morning that are suggesting eighty dollars a barrel is in the uh, is in the offing after what's taken place, especially if you get a longer lasting escalation of, of all of this. Um, airlines, Delta's down, United's down. Anybody holders of these stocks and uh, making any moves, or would you make a move on on a stock that's down today because you think it's unfairly lower? And you think that if it's think not we'll going that, to be a big, long spike. If we get that quick comeback, like I said, two weeks was all that. 20% spike, Judge, in September lasted less than hours before it was a 10% spike. Uh, before two weeks later, September 30th, 29th, something like that, it was back down below where it was prior to the attack on the Saudi facility. So if you're thinking something like that plays out, certainly I think Lufthansa, which I saw down like 7% today, American was down 4 I think Lufthansa is overdone based on that. If you see any stabilization rather than just a huge uh, zoom to the upside out of these uh, uh refined product. That's where you saw the, the biggest losses in the airline complex was overseas. Yep. Some yep. of the more European airlines and, and elsewhere were down much much more sharply than almost we, we, double. Saw, we, we saw here. Let me, let me do this. Let, let's broaden it out then yeah, okay. um, to, the, to the market at large. We had a big day yesterday. We did. Right? We come in today and it's, uh, it's a different picture. Now we've cut the losses by a, a, a large amount. S&P I'm looking right now is down 14 and a half. So w one of the stronger exercises you could perform today is looking at the market and identifying stocks that are actually moving higher in this environment. So Facebook, Alphabet, and I think it was Josh uh, who mentioned yesterday Alphabet in 2020 might be one of the fang names that leads the market higher. Alphabet is now higher on the day. That is exciting to me. You have names like Chipotle and Best Buy, which I own. They are higher on the day. Some of the housing names, John, like Lennar, mm -hmm. they are higher on the day. I'm not saying you have to act, but you take notice and you understand in a down tape what's moving higher. Yeah, and, the, and also what's moving lower unfairly. And that's sort of the point that, that Kramer was making earlier. It's like, look, a lot of stuff is going to be down. Mm -hmm. Take a look at, not necessarily by today, wanted things to be down a little bit more. Don't be in such a rush to, to buy. But the point he was making was there are going to be things that are hit that you look at and say, this is not related in any way, shape, or form to what's that, happening. I did Why it should it be down? So, so uh, I had a REIT store capital go ex-dividend yesterday, the first day of the year. It was down 3% yesterday. I saw it was going to be a down open. I put in a limit order. I got filled almost right to be open. Um, it has absolutely no bearing on the Strait of Hormuz. They're literally, <laughs> they're literally buying real estate from hairdressers and leasing it back to them in, in St. Louis. So, like, for me, that's, like, an obvious way. The REITs and other, quote-unquote, bond proxy sectors had cooled off in December as the 10-year yield rose. Um, but now, if we're going to get back a little bit of fear into the market, you're going to see that 10-year yield fade. You're going to see these stocks start performing again. So I think, I think I'm already up uh, almost a stick on the trade. Not that it's really a trade, it's an investment. But that's a great example of a scenario where you say, okay, this is a name I've wanted to be bigger in. Now I have an opportunity, and it has nothing at all to do with the underlying company. Yeah, Apple's hanging around the uh, the flat line uh, as well, but that stock was one that was in focus yesterday for us because it topped 300 bucks for the first time. It's uh, it closed above there, and now it's this a touch lower. But you got some price target raises today, two of them in fact, and it was the same the same number 330 at B of A and, and RBC. This you know this is the stock that's driven the train. Yeah. Um it's still that these stores uh, that they have on the retail side, Scott, continue to rock. Uh, as far as uh, the 5G, I won't even continue with that. It's going to be huge. But uh, the services, I mean, if you've picked up an 11, you know, their newest model phone, you can't believe the amount of storage that you're going to use with the three camera set on that Pro. Amazing how much extra storage you're going to have to have. That all goes straight up to the cloud because even with a 256 gig phone, you can't hold it all on there, especially if you do any videos. And that's the temptation with all of these multi camera phones. Apple has figured that out. And I think the analysts are exactly right. The, the stock will be higher 
the question is, you know, do you violate the greater uh, pig theory? Not the greater fool, the greater pig. That's why I was lightening up so much on my call not, spreads not yesterday. Not to be too greedy. I, I, yeah, I know right. where you're going. Use um, your discipline. The greater pig theory? The greater pig theory. <laughs> he just invented that. So, <laughs> Megan, like we, it, we haven't... Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. We haven't seen you, you yet in the new year. You too. How do you feel about the market where we are? What are you telling your clients? Well, we are definitely telling them not to overreact to anything they've seen in the past 24 hours, per Joe's point. But we're still constructive on the market. Um, we're overweight equities. We're taking that in international developed and U.S. small cap over large. And I think one of the things that we've seen over the past month or so is a bit of broadening of participation. Um, what you might get from today's oil uh, pop and maybe some of the higher energy names is perhaps some of that bid for value that lagged so much over the past few years. Um, I'm not calling for strong outperformance of value over growth, but there is an opportunity to diversify away a bit from what has worked so well and to get more into areas like U.S. small cap that have certainly done well over the past couple of months. But if you look on a longer time frame, they're uh, cheaper versus U.S. large cap, and they've also lagged. Um, so I think there's opportunities there and then in the international space as well. So yeah. we're constructive. I think the broader picture is really about what happens with this cycle. And I don't see, um, while you know it, it's going to play out probably over months and even years rather than days in terms of what's happening in Iran, um, I don't see that as being the end point for these broader cycles. So let, let's, let's formulate that into a, a debate then here on the desk. And Josh, I just want your view of small cap versus large cap. Better value in small going to outperform large cap. I'm not necessarily sure you agree with that. You, you, you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Well, no. So I, I, I would say that it absolutely could happen. I just, I just, I wouldn't frame it in a market cap size because really what it boils down to is an industry bet, a sector bet. Um, and, and I'm sure you'd agree with that. So like, if you think about the trend in financial stocks going into the end of the year, it was very powerful. And it's not a coincidence that finally the Russell started to catch up with the Qs, the S&P 500, and the Dow. It's very, very heavily tilted toward financials. I think the second most popular sector uh, among the Russell 2000 is industrials. I could be wrong, but that's a sector bet. So you're betting on reflation of the economy for that trade to work. The one caveat, credit quality among small caps is at a wide disparity to credit quality in the S&P 500. Now, it always, there always is some disparity, but now it's wider than it's been in a long time. And I think that speaks to the industry breakdown to some extent. And I think it's also just a fact of life. It's extraordinarily easy for an S&P 500 component to raise money. They could do it with their eyes closed right now. Um, it's actually never been easier, maybe in history. It's not the same for small caps. So now you say, well, that's the opportunity. I think those conditions will get better for smaller cap stocks, and that's why I'm getting long. I have no problem with that thesis. It could play out. The other thing we heard from you yesterday, Joe, was you know buying overseas, buying yes. MSCI, buying EEM. And what was the one you suggested he buy instead of EEM? IEMG. For those who weren't watching? IEMG. Wait, IEMG. If you're an investor, it's, you're going you're gonna to pay a fraction of the uh, basis point fee. But the point is looking for better opportunities overseas. Joe seems to think you're going to find it. Megan seems to think you're going to find it. You've been a fan of, of overseas uh, investments as well, but you're still overweight you in the U.S. For, can, relative to the rest of the no, world. No, I'm overweight the rest of the world versus the U.S. Okay. Uh, I've been for two years. In, this is in across strategic asset allocation models at my firm. Um, and the bet is not, oh, the world is a better place to invest in the U.S. It's about valuation and prospective returns. We know what's gone on in the last 10 years. It's one of the most lopsided 10-year periods for U.S. versus the rest of the world in recorded history. So it's not, oh, the roulette wheel hit, hit black sure. 10 times, I'm betting red. Let's get some mean reversion. Well, it's, it's where are the better prospective returns? You could, you could end up with a scenario in 2020 with double-digit earnings growth for the MSCI Emerging Market Index. I don't know that you could say that for the United States. So, and, and it's not blanket. I'm not like excited about Japan the same way I am about um, you know, EM countries or Europe as I am about LATAM. But I just feel like if you're thinking about the next five to 10 years, you're buying cheaper stocks, in many cases with higher dividends. You, you could get the benefit of a currency tailwind if the dollar continues to be on the weaker side than it's been in recent years. And that's what I'm talking about. Nine-week low for the dollar. Excuse me. Go ahead. I would just add to that that when you're talking about valuations, um, 
don't necessarily expect it to play out over the next month or even, you know, maybe the next six months to a year. These valuation disparities are at, you know, multi-year wides, and these types of predictors tend to be better over the longer time frame, actually five years, ten years. So we recently updated our long-term uh, asset class return expectations and asset allocation, adding more to international because of that long-term view. By, by country, 12, 13 times earnings, the U.S. is 20. And so someone says, yeah, but they have corruption there. Oh, do you, do you not turn on the news here? Uh, yeah, but uh, there, there's the risk of uh, war. Oh, were well, you not watching what went on last night? Like, we understand this. A lot of that is, is priced in. Let's think about what possibly could happen that's better than, than what a lot of people are expecting. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the idea of, of owning both the U.S. and overseas. I think it's a tactical allocation play, and that's really what I have done. I did, by the way, buy IEMG. I was going to ask you if you actually I, took the advice and did it. Well, I actually have both now. I am Joe's advisor, so, <laughs> so I, I, I have both. But good advice is good advice, no matter where it comes from. There, there's the, the opportunity now for some fiscal policy initiatives. We saw that the other night from the Chinese. You're not going to have any fiscal policy initiatives here domestically in the U.S., so you're going to find those opportunities out side of that. The other thing that's compelling is there's durability in the spend from emerging market consumers. So if you look at consumer staple companies, those with the highest revenue exposure outside of the U.S., they actually performed well in 2019. And that was crediting the ability of the consumer to continue to go out there and spend. Now you get some fiscal policy initiatives. And I just think tactically it makes sense. And, and what I'm hearing is a lot of uh, support for emerging markets, but we're actually like international developed. Um, and I think when you look Europe. at... So Europe, Japan, even the UK, some of those risks have subsided. Definitely over the past year with the global slowdown, you wanted to be in the US, you wanted to be away from the international space, but there's actually quite a bit of cyclicality to Europe and Japan because of their export dependency. They're much more dependent on exports than the US. They got hit by the trade war harder exactly, than we did. Exactly, which they were almost collateral damage. You didn't, you didn't expect them to be hurt so hard, and so uh, with, with the trade tensions receding and our expectation for global global growth to pick up over the next year, that's an area of opportunity. And my see. last sort of question to you before we go to break. So, I mean, I, I get the feeling none of you is making a bigger picture decision on where you think the market can now go relative nope. to where you came into the year thinking it might go because of what happened last night, escalating tensions in the Middle East, uh, dare I say, a, well, a, a war between the, the U.S. and, and Iran, so two, two whether thing, two likely things on, or not. Two things on that. Um, we can go back every year in the last 10 years and find a moment of some sort of geopolitical fright um, and then we can measure what the market has done post that event, pre that event. There's very rarely any major difference. Um, and I think that that's something that we lose, we lose context because we see the one day reaction and that's what sticks in our mind. We rarely think about what happened over the, the ensuing six months. The other thing is when I hear markets fall on tension in the Middle East, it's like, oh, the tension that's been going on in the Middle East since Nebuchadnezzar? Like this, the 7,000 years of tension or just this week, like Tuesday, like which is the big fright. So you will never, ever enjoy a period of investing where like things are calm in the Mideast. Sure. The, and the so, difference so is, that expectation out. we bring it full, full circle to where we started. The difference is because of the way that the oil supply and demand equation is today relative to decades ago, you don't get the massive move in oil. Thus, you don't get the massive whoosh down in stocks fretting about a huge spike we could in start oil. Pumping it's more just in a, in different. A week's time. It's, it's never been this way. We are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, the U.S. and Canada, and the, the speed with which um, oil field new assets can be deployed is rapid versus even 10 years ago, and it's not going away. All right. We will uh, take a quick break. Here's what else is coming up on the halftime report. Straight ahead. One analyst is saying Bank of America stock may stall after big run last year. The desk debates in our call of the day. Plus, the investment committee is ready to answer your questions. To reach us, go to cnbc.com slash halftime or tweet us using the hashtag AskHalftime. The Halftime Report with Scott Wapner and the Traders is back in two minutes. My WW has been an amazing journey. 
fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it This ain't just lunch. It's the KFC fill-up lunch for $1.99. It's mighty fine. Tingles your spine, so jump in line because it's time to dine on a mini fillet burger, two hot wings and fries, all for a fist pump in $1.99. What the... <laughs> The KFC fill-up lunch every day until 3 p.m. At participating restaurants every day from 2nd to 26th of January until 3 p.m. only, subject to availability. Peoples of London, don't be like Sergei, slaving Monday to Friday, then so frazzled by weekend, you no cook Sunday lunch. You need me, Alexander, to save the day. Oh, so Sunday lunch means meerkat meals? Exactly! <laughs> Get two for on food with Meerkat Meals at your local favorites, like Bombay Flame. When you buy through Compares Market, qualifying purchase app only two for one selected food, participating restaurants, a la carte only, Sunday to Thursday, teas and season exclusions apply. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn 